Hi, I'm Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I'm Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They're posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of January 25th, 2022 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join me in a moment of silence. <clears throat> Thank you. Now please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Washington, or Member Washington. We have no withdrawn items today. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Gray, and I have a second by Member Perez. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are present either in the boardroom or by remote. We have four sets of minutes to be approved today. 10.05-2021 School Board Workshop, 11.16-2021 School Board Workshop, 12.14-2021 School Board Workshop, and 1.11-2022 School Board Meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Perez, and I have a second by Member Gray. Any discussion? If not, please vote when your lights appear. <clears throat> Member Vaughn? It passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. We are practicing social distancing as much as possible, so we ask that guests in the boardroom keep one chair open between families. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe that all children can be empowered to learn, to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back in the queue. Member Washington will now read the board guidelines. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meetings, let me quickly review the format for our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. 
<clears throat> there are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption on live website, on cable television, on video monitors here in the auditorium. It also can be viewed with closed caption in the online video archive. We have, we have one item scheduled for time certain, 6 p.m. employee input. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking your time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board members, board comments are not directly personally against a board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes. When there are 30 seconds left, you will see a yellow light on the lectern. A red light and a chime will indicate when your time is up. So we will now begin with public comment. The first individual, please come up and just state your name. My name is Jacqueline Muir. I have a seventh grade student in Hillsborough County Public Schools. I own a licensed school age child care facility serving Hillsborough County Schools. I'm a former Hillsborough County teacher and I've subbed for Kelly Services. I've asked a couple of my friends, what are your biggest concerns right now as a teacher? Quote, we want to know how are you going to retain teachers as only new teachers are getting increased salaries, experienced, high qualified teachers at the top of the payroll never see significant raises. Secondly, we are seeing more students with serious disruptive behavior in the classroom and there are no repercussions. The process of getting services is too, too long. Curriculum has consistently changed since Addison Davis became the superintendent. However, there has been no time to adapt and see what is effective. Informational meetings and trainings held after work without pay, end quote. This is from a veteran first grade teacher. Last week, I myself received a Canvas post about disruptive behavior at my daughter's middle school. I sent this email to my child's principal and copied Nadia Combs, secretary. Good morning, my daughter has been out due to COVID, but I was concerned to see your Canvas post about student behavior. I am so sorry you are dealing with these issues. It seems society is struggling and it is showing up in our children. My concern is how this is affecting your staff, the learning environment, and students who do not participate in this type of behavior. I've heard several of these complaints from my daughter, but now seeing it from you in writing is alarming. What percentage of kids act this way that it warrants a school-wide seventh grade specific email? Although I am grateful that you shared the struggles you face, I wonder, is it out of control or isolated? I am copying Nadia Combs secretary on this email in hopes of getting you any support you may need. I know our schools are struggling, underfunded and understaffed. I'm not sure our board truly knows the struggles each one of our school faces. Concerned parent, District 1. Additionally, I received daily texts from my daughter where she tells me how many times an announcement is made that there are classrooms without subs, asking, begging, who can go cover them. I want you to know that I run an after school program in summer camp where I pay 15 to $16 an hour for people, college students usually, to come and take care of the kids. Yet Kelly is not even offering that rate to people who hold bachelor's degrees. How many millions are you wasting with Kelly services? Possibly you could find another way to hire and train substitutes. You have 30 seconds remaining. Finally, in the third quarter of this school year, my daughter has a teacher for beginning Spanish. Although it's great that we finally have a consistent adult in the classroom, the children are still using Hillsborough Virtual to complete their learning. Is this the future of Hillsborough County Schools? Students in a classroom staffed with an adult while doing virtual school? The things I've just shared are happening in what you call A schools. I can only imagine what's going on in other schools across the district. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Dubois, and I'm the chair of Hillsborough Public School Advocates. I'm also a parent to a kindergarten student and an incoming second kindergarten student. Today, I want to focus on our budget allocation. HCPS currently has more than 1,000 job vacancies across all different levels. HPSA is encouraging the board and RCAC to take a good, hard look at these vacancies and determine which ones should be filled and which ones do not need to be filled. After this is done, there are models and indications that HCPS could be in a budget surplus, which is a great position to be in. However, HPSA is advocating that this surplus or any dollars we can find are given towards given teachers and all at all levels of seniority and support staff a raise. DeSantis's plan does not address giving support staff or veteran teachers raises, but let's be honest, every worker in our schools today are essential workers. Florida's in the bottom five states in terms of teacher pay, but somehow Tampa is in the top three in terms of metropolitan growth year over year nationwide. And that growth will result in additional dollars being allocated to HCPS in per pupil funding, which can be put towards the surplus or invested wisely. We're seeing a mass exodus from the teaching profession in the state of Florida to the tune of over 5,000. And most cite pay as the number one reason to leave. There are unforecasted costs associated with this turnover in our district and unforeseen effects on our children's ability to thrive and learn in an environment with constant change. To me, the decision's easy. Let's work together to not only improve the quality of life for every employee in Hillsborough County Public Schools, but improve the quality of the education our children receive as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, school board members, superintendent, and staff. My name is Marie Cloutier, a teacher and counselor for 42 years, now retired from the district, who had the privilege to work with Ken Adam as a principal when he was at Adams Junior High School. As a representative for the many colleagues that worked with Ken Adam while he was a teacher, assistant principal, principal, area director, and mentor, um, we, over his 37 years, with Hillsborough County Schools. We fully endorse Kenneth E. Adam as a name of honor for the new PK-8 school in Apollo Beach, District 2. Ken Adam's leadership style was one that inspired, motivated, and encouraged all staff and students. Ken was open to new ideas and encouraged you to take initiatives to bring a more positive change to the culture and the climate, which ultimately improves student learning. We all are a part of a team, and everyone from the bus drivers to the APs were equal in the education of the students in his charge. Ken always recognized people's efforts and was genuinely outspoken with praise for all those who did great things, no matter how big or small. Ken Adam led by example. He would never do something he would, um, he would never expect you to do something that he would not do himself, from picking up a piece of trash, to writing hundreds of schedule changes with his counselors, to appearing in the talent show. He was the heartbeat of the school. Ken Adam had a unique ability to communicate effectively with every person, respecting the value of their individual integrity with his fair and consistent personal character. Ken Adam believed in community. For example, our Drug Prevention National Pride chapter with our musical group Special Edition would perform across the county, bringing their drug-free message to our youth. And Ken was proudly right there with them. Not only were we fortunate to be a part of Ken's school family, we were also a part of the whole Adam family, and they were a part of us. There is no better tribute than to name the new school after the late Ken Adam. Please let his legacy, marked by service of distinction, loyalty, and honor as a man and as an educator, be an inspiration to the teachers, students, and staff that will hallow those new halls. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Cleveland, and I've been a Hillsborough County music educator for 36 years. I've seen many fantastic teachers and administrators come and go during that time. I've also had the honor of being guest faculty for music workshops all over the US, several European countries, Australia and New Zealand, and I've met some amazing educators who were passionate about their students and about teaching. But in all of my experiences, there is no one who surpasses Ken Adam as a champion of students, families, teachers, and staff. I had the privilege of working with Mr. Adam several years at two schools while he was a principal, Adams Junior High and Gaither High School. And I learned so much from him just by example. Besides the programs he initiated and the many roles he fulfilled, first and foremost, he loved students. He would work tirelessly to help any and all of them. He also supported his teachers and staff and took an interest in us, both professionally and personally, to ensure that we could do our very best work. He attended every co-curricular and extracurricular activity possible, not just to be seen, but to let the students, teachers, and coaches know that their work was important and that he cared. He even participated in our community chorus when invited, although singing was not his field of expertise by any means. He still joined in with his whole heart and a very loud voice. He could always be seen all over the campus encouraging people, students, teachers, and staff, and doing one of his signature moves, Marie mentioned, picking up trash on the floor. He always said, if the kids don't see us caring about our school, they won't care either. I still pick up trash in his honor. I also hold myself to a higher standard as an educator. I value every staff member, and I love students and families better because I knew him. Mr. Adam, as I still refer to him because he'll always be up here to me, was also a devoted family man who loved his wife and children and gave our students an example of family they so sorely needed. They could just look at him and listen to his heart overflow about his family he was so proud of and know that it is possible to forge loving relationships and create peaceful homes, something many of our students cannot even fathom. The most recent appreciation I found for Mr. Adam came during this my final year of teaching when I realized what retirement means. I am in awe to remember that he came back into the schools after retirement as a volunteer mentor to young teachers to ultimately benefit a new generation of students whom he also chose to love. There is no one more deserving of being honored by the naming of this new elementary school and I believe that the administration, staff, faculty and students of that school would be honored to be a part of it being named after a man with such an incredible legacy as Ken Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello again. Um, good afternoon, honorable board, school board members, Superintendent Davis, and staff. My name is Amy Adam Simmons, and I'm the proud daughter of Mr. Ken Adam. <laughs> um, but today I'm speaking on behalf of a fellow student. Um, she's one of my friends. Her name's Amy. And unfortunately, um, she couldn't be here this afternoon um, as a single mom and also a speech therapist like myself in the district. Um, but this is what she planned to present. Um, she says, I had the pleasure of being a student at Adams Junior High under the principalship of Ken Adam. When thinking of how I could paint a picture of Mr. Adam as a principal in relation to his students, I came across and thought of many positive responses that I found on Facebook. And what better way to give you a cross representation of many students' lives whom he touched? Obviously, I'm not going to read every post, but here's a sampling of some of them. So these are the comments from some of his former students. I loved Mr. Adam. What an incredible gift to have a man like him, not only as your principal, but as a mentor. He was a gift to Hillsborough County and so many people. I would love to see this school named for him and his legacy. He was a true servant leader to our school. He was very dedicated and a compassionate leader in Hillsborough County. What a wonderful way to honor his legacy. Mr. Adam was an amazing man. He had a way of calming nerves. He was a smart guy and so, so kind, such a great listener. He made a huge difference in my life. Another one says, I'll always remember my favorite principal. I can say that too, since he was my principal at one point too. <laughs> Another one says, I will always remember walking the halls of Gaither High and no matter what time of day it was, he was always smiling and always said hello to me. Another one says, he had such an impact on my life. His belief in who I was 
and his encouragement helped give me a foundation to build upon. So those were just a few of the many kind remarks that have been going around on Facebook since the survey that my family and I have been sharing and all of our friends. Um, I would love to know the results of that. <laughs> but Mr. Adam, Amy goes on to say, um, Mr. Adam was a truly person, a truly people person. He always made us feel like we were one big family. She says, I got more involved in school because he provided so many opportunities for students to do great things. He cared about all students, whether you were a student athlete or a student with a disability. There was a sense of pride and respect for one another. Teams supported each other. Students from one group would support other groups and vice versa. He set the precedent for that. I could not sum up the life of Mr. Adam as an administrator and as a person better than this last Facebook post. He lived his life pouring into students and his community. You will be blown away that all he gave over his students. A life, a life well lived up to the very end. What an honor it would be to see the new school named after Mr. Ken Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Hope you guys are doing well. My name is Amberlyn Rhodes. I'm with Hillsboro Public Schools Advocates, and I'm here today to advocate for teacher and support staff pay increases. Um, student enrollment is higher than originally projected with more students than expected the district um, hopefully we'll get an additional 28.7 million additionally as you're all aware we have more than a thousand job vacancies and not all of those need to be filled by you know scrutinizing every position before hiring the district could save an additional 30 million dollars um, that could go back into the budget while we believe a budget surplus is a great thing and a good goal to have um, teacher and school staff is morale is very low um, they have become parental figures disciplinarians mental health counselors um, along with their daily job of educating our children um, as you're well aware over or you may not know over 5,000 teachers left the profession in 2021 this is the one of the largest um, numbers that we've ever seen in history and one of the biggest reasons is because of pay uh, the plan that governor DeSantis has put before um, the legislature it excludes veteran teachers in getting raises it raises the floor which is great it's a great goal to have but 80,000 teachers in the state of Florida would be left out of that plan and getting pay increases additionally the thousand dollar bonuses that he's planning to give out leaves out support support staff and in Hillsborough County that's over 8,000 individuals that will not see a thousand dollar bonuses so how about we think about this 30 million dollars either from vacancies or from the additional enrollment money that we'll be getting to give our teachers and support staff a boost, a boost in morale that they so desperately need. I really appreciate you listening and um, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Julie Gebhards. Um, I'm thankful, Ms. Gray, that you brought up that January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month and pointed out that Florida is third in the nation for human trafficking. This is a really grievous thing. Um, we need to do whatever we can about this. You also mentioned that the most common age for those pulled into this horrific industry is 11 to 13 years old. 11 to 13 years old. I have a 12 year old and that is um, really tragic. And I also have four daughters and what I'm about to talk about is horrific again. A 10 or 11 year old girl can go into the Monroe Middle School Library and find several copies of the book titled The Perks of Being a Wallflower. In this book, which we find 58 copies of throughout our county, she can read about a teen couple doing it doggy style using a plastic bag instead of a condom. She can read about teens pretending to have sex with a blow up Gumby doll or multiple references to girls being forced or intimidated into having sex or an abortion that Charlie drives his sister to to get and then keep secret from their parents. It's hard to stop there because the book is loaded with drug use, sexual encounters of all kinds, including a girl masturbating with a hot dog, pedophilia, forced oral sex, attempted sex with a dog, and more. Really? Like, it's unbelievable. 58 copies in our library, and it's in middle school libraries. 10, 11, 12-year-old kids. 
According to one Amazon review, this book normalizes toxic relationships and abusive lifestyles. If we want to stop, if we want to help stop sex trafficking, we need to stop normalizing these types of things with books all over our school libraries with this stuff in it. We are creating a disastrous scenario for these kids. What does this awful material teach 10 and 11 year old girls about themselves? Kids, what does it teach them about themselves? What about the innocence of these kids? If you honestly think reading a graphic explicit book detailing all of these things is a resource to help children who may be dealing with abuse, these books offer no help. In fact, they deepen the problem, making abuse seem normal, so normal that kids remain silent for years as we've recently seen with some of the Blake High School students. They're left trying to cope with their pain and shame on their own. With books making all of this normal, what message are we sending? How are we helping to protect our kids from this? These issues are not addressed properly in these books. The abuses are glorified and confiscated. Sexual exploitation follows the normalizing of these behaviors. There is definitely a link and we need to be aware of this. Human trafficking is a $150 billion a year industry globally. And I believe by doing nothing and leaving these books on our shelves, we are aiding in industrializing the sex industry. We stir up these kids' curiosity and grooming is happening too. The supply and demand principle is at work here and we need to stop both. Thank you. Thank Next you. speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Gay Jones. I'm a parent, grandparent of a uh, child in Hillsborough County School. Continuing the theme of uh, human trafficking, <clears throat> I would like to explain to you how the school system's inclusion of pornographic materials is contributing to the sexual, sexual exploitation of children. Exposing children to sexual content early normalizes sexual behaviors such as pedophilia and commercial sexual ex exploitation. Behaviors introduced in educational materials should not normalize sexual activity to minors. Just as people are concerned with violence on television desensitizing to violence, it's the same with sexual content. Exposing them early also creates the supplies needed to keep sex trafficking alive and well. By supplies, I mean children, like supply and demand, and it's called grooming. When children are desensitized, they are not able to clearly distinguish between appropriate and inappropriate behaviors because they've been exposed already. That paired with the fact that children are most often trafficked by someone they know is terrifying. I ask you to truly consider the ramifications of early exposure to sexuality, sexual behaviors, pedophilia, rape, and so on. Teaching a child right from wrong is a parent's responsibility, as is teaching a child about topics such as these. As parents, we want to trust our schools and support administrators. We want to be able to support the schools, but when we are battling the damage of overt sexualization, it's hard to rally behind our representatives. We want to, we, um, our school boards and school administrators and parents have worked together for decades because that's what it's necessary for healthy, educated children. The idea that parents are the enemy and elected, and elected officials don't listen to their constituents is extremely sad. As the school board of Hillsborough County, I ask you to work with the parents of children you are educating. Help us protect the children from por pornography, human traffic, and other potential harms. We are formally challenging over 100 books in the HCPS libraries by the end of January. We need your support. As taxpaying citizens, do not make us a party to the distribution of pornogra pornographic materials. In closing, I would like to leave you with a, um, a statistic. Not only is Florida number three in the country for human trafficking, Central Florida makes up 23% of the total human trafficking in Florida, the highest region in the state. Removal of damaging materials from our libraries can make a difference. What if you could save even one child if he or she were not exposed? Do you have the authority? If you do, please do it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, um, we finished with the speakers. We'll now move on to the recognitions and proclamations. A01, Adoption of Proclamation, Hillsborough Healthy Schools. Member Gray will be presenting this proclamation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
and uh, we talk about the quality of life and the quality of education, and it's important. So we're going to hit right on this with the Healthy Schools Committee proclamation. We are pleased to recognize the Hillsborough County Public Schools Healthy Schools Committee. This dedicated committee promotes mental, emotional, and physical health throughout our schools and district offices. The committee has aligned resources with principals, government agencies, community partners, and organizations to improve the health and well-being of all children. We have also recently adopted a wellness policy that includes the establishment of a healthy schools team at every school site. Thank you, board members. I am very proud that 84 of our schools earned a gold healthy schools designation 93 schools earned a silver healthy schools designation and 26 of our schools earned a bronze healthy schools designation congratulations to these schools and we look forward to highlighting them during our next recognition meeting on april 12th april 12th thank you member <laughs> um, can i uh, thank the committee members yes uh, our heartfelt thanks go to the committee members, which are many, uh, Ken Hart, Kim Bays, our superintendent, Ann Townsend, Araceli Martinez-Pina, Ashley Capucci, Carlessa Lyons, Colette Boggs, Corey Culpepper, Deborah Blossom, Dina Marshall, Ebony Golf, Elizabeth Tanna, Eric Stones, Felita Lewis, Holly Saya, Janice Harris, Chief John Newman, Julia uh, Saramento, Kim Swartz, Lenita Lucas, Laura Cross, Lillian Perez, oh, Lynn Gray, Maria, my secretary, DeHusis Columna, Maria Ross, Michael McGauley, Nicole Binder, Quinta Oates, Sarah K. Bonte, Shaney Hall, Shanshira Quinn, Shay McRae, Susan Suberkett, Tanya Arja, Tahika Lovett, Tracy Schatzberg, Tracy Brown, and Van Ayers. To all of you, our heartfelt thanks and appreciation for your devoted and dedicated time that you give to our students, which are the most important ingredient to our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. I need a motion and a second to approve the Hillsborough Healthy Schools. I have a motion by Member... Snively, and I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. A02, Adoption of Proclamation Black History Month, February 2022nd, with the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Member Washington will be presenting this proclamation. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's truly an honor for me to present this proclamation for Black History Month. Uh, Black History Month provides an opportunity for us as citizens of a great nation to recognize and reflect on the contributions of African Americans and celebrate the local and national legacies of civil rights movement. Black History Month recognized the many African Americans who have played key roles in the history of our nation, frequently overcoming great adversity to do so. The study of prominent African Americans provides students with valuable role models and deeper understanding that, that American strength lies in the diversity of its people. Each February, our schools and students celebrate Black History Month in important and innovative ways, and we look forward to seeing this year's celebration. Thank you very much, Mr. Washington. I need a motion and a second to approve Black History Month, February 2022nd. I have a motion by Member Perez and I have a second by Member Snively. Any discussion? Yes, I'd like to say I like to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Member Washington, for that. Um, since we're talking about black history, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of Black History Month. 
1926, Carter G. Woodson started Black History Week to rectify the fact that black people were overlooked, ignored, and even suppressed by the writers of history textbooks and the teachers who use them. Woodson chose the second week of February because it coincided with the birth dates of President Abraham Lincoln and the slavery abolitionist Frederick Douglass. In 1970, black educators and students at Kent State University began using the entire month of February to celebrate and recognize black triumphs and tribulations. U.S. presidents started to formally designate February as Black History Month in 1976. At the heart, Black History Month is about celebrating the many black first that we are still that are still occurring despite systemic barriers without acknowledging that black ancestors built much of the physical economic and cultural foundation that you, the United States stands upon however a new bill in Tallahassee entitled individual freedom is being proposed in our Florida legislation and it would ban public schools and private businesses from making people feel discomfort when being taught about racial discrimination in US history let's be honest there's no way of teaching black history in our country without some people feeling uncomfortable. Just like there's no way of teaching about the horrors of the Holocaust without people being uncomfortable. You can't teach about the importance of, Harry, of people like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass himself, Rosa Parks, MLK, Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, John Lewis, Muhammad Ali, George Washington Carver, without teaching about the horrors of slavery, oppression, segregation, Jim Crow, and historically racist policies that have been embedded into our nation's history. And that's okay, because we, didn't, we don't grow and learn from our mistakes without studying them to begin with. We don't get better without some discomfort. Woodson believed that celebrating black history was a political act to destroy the dividing prejudice of, na of nationality and teach universal love without the distinction of race, merit, and rank. And that a failure to accept black people as fellow architects of the United States is an existential threat to the nation that we all call home. So as we celebrate Black History Month, let's be honest about people who are attempting to demonize things like critical race theory, social emotional learning, bias training, because these are an attempt to whitewash our history. And if we do that, we attempt, we make the mistake of possibly repeating things like that. So I just wanted to <laughs> talk about the history of why we're celebrating Black History Month, the importance of black history, and making sure that we properly teach it in our schools so we don't repeat some of the mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? Thank you, Member Vaughn, for those comments, and thank you, Madam Chair. So we have so many black leaders that go before us forging paths, especially here in Hillsborough County. And one of those leaders um, was Elijah Bing. Um, he was a native of Plant City. He built a 48-year career as a civil rights and education uh, pioneer here in Hillsborough. In 1971, he was employed with Hillsborough County School, the Hillsborough County School Board. He, Bing helped draft a landmark um, desegregation plan before joining the school board and becoming the first black assistant superintendent in the county. He was considered one of the best and mo most innovative principals in the district, one who raised standards for students and teachers, challenging both towards excellence. He served four years in World War II and then went to Florida A&M University, graduating with a degree in biology. He continued on to Columbia University in New York, where he received a master's degree in education. He returned to Florida because he wanted to change things in his hometown, Plant City, where his parents resided. He accepted a principal's position at Glover, an all-black school. He made a giant step forward towards his work in Hillsborough County Schools desegregation plan, which was approved and implemented. Later in 1983, he was appointed by the then Governor Bob Graham as the first, first black Hills, Hillsborough County Commissioner. He was a lifetime member of the NAACP, but he hung up his sword and shield in the civil rights movement to make a way for a younger generation. In his later years, he served as a consultant to many organizations. 
And um, Member Snively and I had the opportunity to go to the MLK breakfast in Plant City um, a couple of Sundays ago. And, um, you know, to be able to hear um, what our black leaders, um, so, um, you know, here in, in Hillsborough County, um, so just honorably have to say, but like the um, U.S. Representative Yvette, Yvette Clark of New York says, we must never forget that black history is American history. The achievements of African Americans have contributed to our nation's greatness. And yes, African Americans are Americans. To debunk what was said a couple of days ago in, in, in the press, um, but thank you, uh, Member Washington, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Member Press. Member Gray? Mm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Vaughn. Thank you also, uh, Member Perez, for being very respectful uh, to the African American community. Um, the Black History Month is not just one month. It is the entire year uh, that we now think of it. And I want to thank uh, uh, an extraordinarily um, busy group uh, who participate in honoring um, our black history and our leaders and our students to learn. And I'm staring at Monica Vera Torado as the diversity chief who was very much involved as is Superintendent Davis with our African American task force and the, um, the, the real players in our, in our city of Tampa, Fred Hearns, leads the history in real time. He is iconic, and he has single-handedly helped thread the needle in weaving, thank you, Terry Connor, uh, the African-American history, important cultural and uh, leaders in our curriculum. Why that is important is because, as we all know, Member Perez and Member Vaughn, the rest of you, um, education is the biggest equalizer. And the more we can get our, our uh, black students and our Hispanic students and all the other students of uh, cultural diversity uh, educated, the better off we're all going to be in so many ways. And we'll keep them in school. I want to also thank uh, Sheikh Washington for his busy work uh, in his community, uh, largely a minority community, but um, Sheikh, even before you got elected, I know you were at the schools because I used to see you at the schools. And, uh, and he has led the charge uh, in, in such a, a great way for um, his district, but also in the leadership in the African American Task Force. Um, I did want to go ahead and thank Ursula, which I can't remember your last name, Ursula, but everyone knows her. She does the murals in the Booker T. Washington School and uh, so many schools, but she also participates in various walks and talks, as does Fred Hearns. I don't know who's better with the uh, walk and talk, is if it's Ursula or uh, Fred, but nonetheless, and thank you, board members, for participating not only in the breakfast, which I didn't get a chance to, uh, but I also know that Member Snively, myself, Nadia Combs, and Member Perez, uh, we were on the on the parade, and uh, or in the parade, and that was a great uh, event as well. So, uh, this board and our superintendent and our wonderful cabinet, we have a lot of work to do, and we will do it. But we do definitely care about the equity in education, and uh, so. Thank you, all of you, um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the board because we got to keep going. Uh, Harriet Tubman, who was a black female, uh, she was a conductor for the Underground Railroad, and she worked there for eight years leading the slaves, enslaved people, freedom during the Civil War. And I live by this every day. I think it's important to live by. She said, if you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, she said, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want the taste of freedom, keep going. So we got to keep going to have the taste of freedom. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Member Washington. Please vote when your lights appear.
And it passes unanimously. I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Perez and I have a second by Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. The consent agenda has now been approved. I now call on Superintendent Davis to highlight our administrative appointments. Yes, Madam Chair Combs, thank you so very much. And uh, tonight we have an opportunity to highlight and recognize a new leader in the transformational network. Um, with this said, we had a leader that transitioned out of, of our school district to get closer to home and had an opportunity to find a leader that was dedicated to content that really understood how to go into uh, a school regardless of the complexity of the school to be able to turn around not only the culture but to be able to establish a foundation of excellence with curriculum. Um, this leader has uh, you know, started in Hillsborough County in 2008 at Davis Elementary School as a teacher and then transitioned to become a assistant principal, has been an assistant principal for, um, for the last couple years in the Transformation Network and the Achievement School uh, theme as well, was an assistant principal at Oak Park over the last couple of years, as you know, what, uh, with partnership with with Principal Moody, transitioned Oak Park from being a systemic 17 out of 21 years uh, un as rated as underperforming and moved it from an F to a C. And, and then this year being able to transition to James Elementary School, uh, working with Nicole Bennett uh, to be able to lift and create some of the same mindset of moving the school in a positive direction. With that said, with uh, Miles uh, Elementary School really needing a leader to, to be recognized uh, by the state of Florida it related to differentiated accountability and being hit, hitting all the credentials and background. I really give great thanks to um, Shea McRae, also Rachel O'Day and, and Star Connor for really working to build a, a bench of future leaders. And it is my pleasure to be able to highlight and recognize the new principal, which is Mrs. Carla Nolan. You please come up. Carla has uh, rolled out uh, the new curriculum with, uh, you know, K through five. She's done a really nice job with making certain that coaching academies are, are being uh, implemented with provide ongoing systemic feedback to be able to improve our work. And uh, we look forward to your leadership. We look forward to supporting you and uh, know that uh, it's an exciting feeling until you start walking in the car and realize that you're it's your building now. Uh, so uh, enjoy this moment. No, just kidding. <laughs> but as you can heard, many of our, our speakers uh, speak about you know, you've done a remarkable job in a very trying time the last 22 months. And uh, hats off for you, and I uh, look forward to supporting you in your work. Okay? If you're going to take a picture real fast. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, congratulations. We will now move on to the discussion agenda. First, we will be on 6C09, Comprehensive Annual Fiscal Report to the fiscal year end June 30th, 2021. Todd Webster from KPMG will highlight this item. Madam Chair, point of um, information while we're waiting for Mr. Webster to come. There are some folks waiting out there um, to here if the board approved all of the field trips that were on the agenda, on the consent agenda. Just wanted to let parents know that when we approve this consent agenda, all of those field trips have been approved. So um, that way they don't have to worry if we're gonna vote on it later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Snively, for the clarification. And somebody will go out and do that. I think Communications Department will, will do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Webster? Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Todd Webster. I'm an audit partner with KPMG. Um, we've been the auditors for the district uh, probably 20 years now. Um, I've been fortunate to be involved for the last uh, seven years and, and appreciate the opportunity to present to you the audit results for the 2021 audit this year. Um, an audit is a pretty big undertaking, as you may know. We have lots of responsibilities. Management has lots of responsibilities as part of the audit. Um, first and foremost, we've been engaged to issue an opinion on the uh, audited fund or the CAFR, if you will. Um, we've been engaged to issue opinion on that. But management's responsible for preparing that. We are, our responsibility is to uh, uh, issue an opinion on that in accordance with 
uh, generally accepted accounting standards or auditing standards as well as government auditing standards. Um, there's a lot of undertaking that goes along. So we look at various controls that are in place over different parts of the, the um, whether it's the, the, the income statement, the balance sheet, we look at various controls in place over the development of those numbers, as well as performing substantive procedures to get comfortable with those numbers. We also have several specialists involved as part of our audit actuaries related to pension or related to the um, self-insurance reserves, things of that nature. Um, when, we're, when it's all said and done, um, we do or we have issued an opinion on December 16th with respect to, um, it's an unqualified opinion with respect to the financial statements. It's a clean opinion. It's what you're looking for. It's not necessarily guaranteed at the outset, but it is certainly what you're looking for. We do issue several other byproducts as related to the audit, one being a report on internal controls that's required by government auditing standards. It's not a, a re, an audit of internal controls like you would for a public company, but to the extent that we rely on controls, if we, bring, if we have issues, we would certainly bring that to your attention. But this uh, opinion indicates that we, had, we did not any, identify any uh, control deficiencies that were considered significant deficiencies and material weaknesses. Um, and, and so again, that's what you're striving for. That will be issued as part of the single audit that we're working on and we'll be issuing sometime in February. We also do an examination report as re required by the Auditor General over your, comp of your compliance with state statutes related to your investment policies. And, and that again is a, com a clean opinion um, associated with that, no findings to speak of there. Um, we will issue a management letter that's required by the Auditor General. Um, we'll issue that in conjunction with the single audit when that's issued or completed. Um, speaking of the single audit, that's a compliance audit of, with, of your compliance with federal grants. Um, and, and I think this year we're auditing eight, compliant, or eight grants, so we're looking at what are the controls over that as well as the compliance. As of now, we have not identified any issues. To the extent that we do, we would certainly share that with management and they would bring that back to you, um, you know, if, there's, if there's concerns. Lastly, we will issue or we have issued a report called the Required Communications. It's discussed in more detail everything that we've talked about. About, um, or that I've just talked about in greater detail. Um, so there shouldn't be any surprises when you look at that. So um, that's what I've had prepared today. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, for you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. I need a motion and a second to approve item 6C609. I have a motion by Member Gray and I have a second by Member Perez. Any discussion or any questions? Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to give the superintendent any opportunity to re, uh, share information with us. I know that um, you, you and your team have been very involved throughout this process. And so if there's anything that you wanted to express with regard to the CAFR, then I wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to do that, either you or Ms. Johnson. Yes, ma'am, to the chair. Uh, I would say we really appreciate our relationship. I know we had an opportunity with uh, Chair Combs to go over uh, this uh, review and this audit. Once again, we continue to identify that uh, Hillsborough County is in a good spot related to all the procedures and protocols that we have put in place related to our, our, our finances and our implementations with our systems and our, and our processes. I don't know if Dr. Johnson, I mean, Dr. Johnson just gave you, Dr. you if Ms. Johnson wants to highlight anything related to this or her team, but um, from our side of it, we appreciate the analysis. We know it has to be thorough and um, y'all have done a really nice job to be able to allow us to identify how we continue to, continue to improve to get better. And it's a, a solid, good report and a reflection of the, of the hard work that continues to be implemented by uh, our financial team. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Gray? Uh, thank you, Superintendent Davis, and thank you, Member Snively, for uh, letting uh, the good news, and Mr. Webster also for the uh, thorough report. I did want to say that a big thank you goes to Ms. Johnson and her staff, a uh, staff of, of just, what, four or five, with the seventh largest school district in the nation. And this is the, I'm just going to give a synopsis uh, in a one or two sentence that you wrote. Um, and this is on page two, there are no deficiencies, significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in the design or operation of internal control over financial reporting of which we are aware, which could adversely affect the district's ability to initiate, authorize, record, process, or report financial data. 
And the reason I spell this out is because that's an amazing, um, it's not a summary, but it is, and I, I'm sh sure, Mr. Webster, you'll agree, the work that they do under the superintendent is amazing. And I, I know I speak for the board, but I just want to say thank you uh, for giving us this good report and the CAFR as well, which uh, we'll need for future uh, needs. I'm not going to say why, but <laughs> they're coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question that you may or may not be able to answer, but I thought I would ask it. In other counties, they have these, you know, government, the, the federal or the, the state mandated audits. But in other counties, they also have, as Superintendent Davis has said, a board hired auditor that would do something similar to, to what you've done. Do you see anything that would be a benefit or anything that would be different in the auditing if we as a board were to hire our own auditor that would be different than what you would do or in counties that have something similar do you find different findings from from what you have and their internal auditor i'm just trying to get feedback from you about our board hiring our own auditor yeah I, i'm not aware i'm not been involved in any whether it's a school district or any other client that our firm has where there would be two auditors doing the same audit um, so I have no experience with that, and so I'm not familiar with that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Member Vaughn, and thank you, Mr. Webster, for your time. Um, oh, we have one more. Member <clears throat> Snively has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Right. I, I think um, to address the question that Ms. Vaughn posed, um, that the the auditor that we've been talking about or you brought up at, at school board meetings it does specific um, different duties uh, than what KPMG and Mr. Webster does. It's more of a day-to-day -day operational auditing the processes and uh, things of that nature as opposed to what you do with our, our CAFR. Gotcha. Thank you. Superintendent Davis. Yes, ma'am. I, I, through the chair, I completely agree. It'd be it'd be separate. Um, you know, as we look at all of the the debt services and looking at our fund balance and our reserves of, from uh, this particular audit, being able to have a, a scope and sequence for an internal auditor, be able to look at all of our procurements, look at our contracts, and look at our uh, CI CPIs. Have they if they've changed within our school district to make certain that we are leveraging uh, you know our strength and every dollar and every cent internally. So, um, you know, we just have to come back to the board, and, and I can do it individually, determine the appetite. We have a job description that has been uh, approved, and then I've sent a scope and a sequence, a follow-up, and we just got to figure out next steps of what that will look like. If there's, Can I respond one more time based on what – now that the – Yeah, yes, sir. So I, I guess <laughs> restating, uh, yeah. to have an operational audit by another auditor, internal audit, certainly we do see that. Um, I was thinking more of – duplicating the efforts that we do but clearly uh, operational type audits on a regular basis we do see that either externally or internally by your own internal audit department to the extent that they have the ability and time to do it and can i ask one more question have they ever been in contrast with what you found on those audits generally no because they're doing different things than what we look at all right thank you thank you everybody and thank you for the clarification please vote when your lights appear And it passes unanimously. Next up is 601 budget amendments for the period ending in December 31st, 2021. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, to the chair. This is our budget uh, amendments for the period ending December 31st, 2021. At this time, I'm going to transition to Mrs. Johnson, who will go over these um, amendments and the budget amendments to be able to provide information to the board and the community. Ms. Johnson. Good evening, board members, chair, superintendent, and constituents. Instead of going over the board a budget amendment, we're going to do a highlight because it's the mid-year. So the next slide is going to show. I'm trying to look from the historical perspective and really um, go on the impact of an operational deficit and look at the fund balance. So we can do a little education here, too. Um, looking at the five-year five historical fund balance that's taken from the CAFR, we added zeros so we can be. This could be impactful. So it's 
different, we may, wanted to put it in the millions and the billions. And if you can see that the district from 2016, 17, throughout present, has been at an operational structure deficit. And what that means is we are spending more than we bring in. So our expenditures exceeds our revenue. As you can see, in 2016 and 17, we was in $49.8 million operational deficit. 17-18, it was 25.3. 18-19 was 54 million. 19-20, And pre-close, and I wanna talk about this fiscal year 2021. We showing an operational deficit 92.1 million in that fiscal year, operational deficit. And we was projecting at that time, before I came in January, you guys was projecting a 23 million fund balance deficit. That was the over, kudos to the superintendent and the staff here. They turned that around from that projection being a negative 23, 70 million turnaround in that fiscal year to give a positive fund balance of 47.4 pre-close. Pre-close, that's when the actual revenue and expenditures when we closed the fiscal books, when the auditors came. But before the audit came, when you close the books, those are actual revenues we've received in and expenditures at that time. And that's still, our operational deficit was 92.1. You can see that in the pre-close. Everyone seeing that? Okay, post-close. We move eligible expenditures to different federal resources. So we move over 100 million expenditures from our general fund to other federal resources. So that's actual movement. It impacts the fund balance. It does not impact our operational deficit. And in some slides, we're gonna show that. So that brows us at post-close a positive fund balance of $147.5 million, okay? But we are still in operational deficit. So I wanted to show that again. I wanted to go over pre-close where, where we actually ended. We actually closed the books. We had a fund balance of $47.4 million. Then we did the strategy. Remember, we was on fiscal oversight. We're still over oversight from the state because we had to come up with a fiscal recovery plan. The state is currently monitoring us monthly to ensure that we um, meet our target for each our fund balance for this fiscal year. So, but before we close, the fiscal strategy moved thirty-eight point nine million dollars off our general fund. Before we close, we got ESSER 2 came in. Remember, we was all waiting patiently for ESSER 2 to come in. <laughs> so ESSER 2 came in. We move additional $61 million off our journal fund, these eligible expenditures that could be moved to this resource. So this is a one-time, non-recurring expenditures we're moving to another federal resource. So that gave us a positive fund balance, not an operational, fund balance of $147.5 million. As we adopt the budget, I just want everyone to pay close attention to this. Our revenue is pretty close to when we had the same revenues when we closed the books. We closed the books at $1.5 billion and $43 million in revenue. We, our adopted budget, if this is projection, we were projecting we receive $1,556,000,000 in revenue, okay? Now, as you look at the post-close, we have went down by moving those eligible expenditures to $1.513 million, $1 billion, $513 million. But if you look at pre-close, our actual expenditures was $1,613,000,000. Our adopted budget, our expenditures go right back up because those expenditures never go anywhere. They, we still have the same people <laughs> and staff. We just temporarily move those expenditures to another resources. We're back at $1,618,000,000. So we're in a $61 million operational deficit at this time when we build our adopted budget. So everyone understand that? And I'm showing this because I wanted to show you a variance from 
pre-close and adopted budget. We're so close to the same projection in revenue. Our revenue only came higher this year because our local property tax mill went up. And also our expenditures went up a little bit because utility costs went up, our federal you know, rates and taxes, and, and those benefits costs went up. But we also, when we opened this fiscal year, we moved, had moved $10 million of spark money that's usually paid out of the general fund to ESSER. So that decreased our expenditure. So this really should be a 14 million over here, variance that are a 4 million. So everyone understanding that? So now we're projecting this fiscal year when we open up an 86 million fine balance at fiscal year end June 30th. Okay? The next slide is to show where we are now. So from the oper operating, when we adopt the budget, we was at $86.1 million fund balance. Now we had a reduction. In September, we got a notice from the state saying that we have students that went to private, used their private grant funding, went to McKay and Family Empowered Scholarship. So those people reduced our overall revenue from the state, $28.2 million. That impacts our revenue. That impacts our operational deficit, and it impacts our fund balance. Anytime revenue decreases, our deficit goes up, and our fund balance decreases. If expenditures increase, our fund balance <laughs> decrease, and our operational deficit goes down. So I just want everybody to know the impact of revenue against our operational deficit and our fund balance. So we got a decrease in revenue, therefore, our operational deficit has increased to 89.6 million, and our fund balance decreased to 57.8 million. That's our projection today if we did nothing. But you know, we have plans. We're going to do things this fiscal year. But this is where we stand as of December the 31st when we close our fiscal bills. This next slide is portraying the orange showing fiscal year last year, 2021, versus our current fiscal year. And as you can see, this is the same bell curve we always see in our cash flow projections that around December, the month of December, we get our one-time local millage and our revenue start coming in in December. November, December, and January. Then it start tapering off. And you can see that our revenue start dropping, is, but our expenditures are constant. So therefore, our expenditures going to out in, you know, outpace our revenue that we actually receive. So at the end, we're projecting to have a cash flow of 68 million. But as you notice in October last year, September, if you know, we closed that month with 80 million of revenue on hand. But around that time, we had to go out for a 10 because we pay 68 million biweekly for um, just our payroll. So we couldn't make payroll at that time. I wasn't here, but it's possible <laughs> we couldn't meet payroll at that time. So we had to go out for a 10, and that 10 was around 75 million. So at that time, you can see that we increased in October, that 10, we received that re resources, and then we paid it back in January when we got our property taxes. Okay, what I wanted to show here is our fund balance because we're in December. And December show actual landing our fund balance because I get called from constituents, oh, you guys showing a positive fund balance. We got 244 million. Yes, at this time, we have a fund balance, actual fund balance of 244 million. But this is actual. Versus revenue received, revenue versus the fund balance we have received revenue to date of $1 billion. We have expenditures to date as December of $910 million. So we are in a surplus right now of $91 million. We had transfer. We actually did transfers in for other funding sources of $5.6 million. So that gave us a net change of an increase of $97.1 million. Then we had our fine bill, our beginning fine balance of $147.5 million. That would give us a positive fund balance of $244 million. So that, as of today, that is positive. But our projection, the other side is showing our projection. Revenues received, we're projecting to receive $1.5 billion of revenue. 
to the district, minus charter school revenue and expenditures. Um, our expenditures, we're projecting, this is projections, not in our budget, just receive 1.6 million. We're gonna be in an operational deficit of 111 million. And then we're gonna do a transfer, more transfer. The total transfer will be 21.6 million this year. That would give us a general fund operational deficit of 89.6, what we're projecting. Our beginning fund balance is 147.5 million. They'll give us an any fund balance projection of 57.8 million. This is projection versus actual. We plan to do things that I already present things to you, fiscal recovery plan that would address the operational deficit. The operational, when we address the operational deficit, therefore it increased the fund balance also. So we're doing two things. When I address the fund, the operational deficit with a fiscal recovery plan is gonna fix the fine balance also will increase. But th that's just projection. But before I go in, into that in more detail, I wanted to look at the fine balance so everybody could understand what the state is looking at when they talk about fine balance, how much we need. On the chart on the, on the right, we're showing that our projected fine balance as of to date is only $57.8 million. So this, of course, in our what's embedded in that fund balance, we always have category of findings. That's restricted resources. Those are ca categories that we don't spend. They go right back into our fund balance. So that's 35 million. We're projecting around 35 million. Then our inventory on hand, we're projecting is around 4.5 million. Okay, but the state doesn't care about those those analysis, but they care about the unrestricted and the unassigned. So when we're talking about what your fine balance is going to look like from the state, based on the 57.8 million fine balance we're projecting, we're showing that we're going to only have 18.3 million. That's only 1.2 percent. So on the left of this slide, the state recommends that the fine balance be 3 percent of our revenues we bring in. Currently, our revenue is projected at $1.5 billion, and 3% of that is around $45 million. So $18 million versus what we have on hand, if we land at $57 million, is only $18 million. We're $27 million short of what the state recommended before they monitor us. You know, you don't, you, if you over that, you get $45 million. If we reach that target, the state was, will not monitor us. But there are also state requirement that at least we meet 2%. And this is, right now, we, if we landed at 57, fine balance is on 18 million. 2% is 30.5 million. So we're 12 million short of that. That means we can go in receivership. But we know, I'm not saying that we're going to receivership, we all know we got a plan <laughs> that that is not going to happen, that we have a fiscal recovery plan that's going to be coming soon to the board, and also a fine balance recovery plan. That fine balance is going to be moving eligible expenditures one time to our ESSER grant. So that will impact the fine balance. The other plan would affect the operational deficit, but in conjunction, both will impact the fine balance. So I wanted to give this slide, the next slide, just to show you the impact of the fine balance in the operational deficit. So these things, this is a, a little handy dandy if you wanna keep it around. <laughs> Permanent increase in revenue. If we increase revenue, we got an increase of fluctuation of revenue like the state increase our allocation, that would increase our fine balance. Our fine balance would be positive state. And it would decrease our operational deficit. So we're in a deficit now. So if they give us increase in revenue, it'll decrease that deficit. A permanent decrease in expenditure will increase the fine balance that if we cut some expenditures off our, our, our um, current projections, that will increase our fine balance. And a decrease in expenditure will also decrease our operational deficit if it's a permanent decrease. Now, a permanent movement of eligible expenditures to other funding resources, like I'm looking at to permanent move some of these expenditures that's hitting the general fund to other federal sources, that would increase our fund balance and decrease our operational deficit. One-time movement 
of eligible expenditure to other funding sources will increase our fund balance. You guys are going to see our fund balance is going to increase, but has no impact on our operational deficit. So I want to make sure everyone understand that. Moving, moving eligible expenditures just for bookkeeping, financial statements, sake, and trying to keep money, give us time to um, fix our structural deficit, it just give us time. It does not impact our operational deficit. So one-time non-recurring revenue resource. So we get a fluctuated one-time of revenue that comes in the general fund. That will increase our fund balance, but has no impact on our operational deficit, because that's one time. A decrease in revenue, a permanent decrease in revenue, decrease our fund balance, like that McKay scholarship. If we, if we don't receive that money back, that's a permanent decrease in our fund balance and it does increase our operational deficit. Permanent reoccurring increase in expenditures. So any reoccurring expenditures that we say we're going to uh, give or increase our expenditure in any capacity, it decreases our fund balance and it increases our operational deficit. One time, non-recurring increase in expenditures decrease our fund balance but has no impact on our operational deficit. Is there any question? Okay. Um, Member Perez? I have a question back <clears throat> when you were speaking about the students that have um, no longer come to Hillsborough County, but we have students that leave Hillsborough County they take their money with them, and then what happens? Well, let me ask this question: How many students in in the school year of 20, 21, 22 left Hillsborough County Schools? Do you know? So, I mean, this was around four thousand, but we received over four thousand students back when we did our actual count week. So, we're still waiting for the state to see where we fall out as far as um, allocating those resources back to the district. That's where I was yes, yes, ma'am, to the chair. So what we're trying to do is recoup that money. And there's an appeal process to be able to identify who has left, and we validate that, but also be able to identify who has transitioned back to us and provide the Department of Education with those uh, with that data sets and to be able to prove that we have those students back to be able to retain some of the funding that they pretend, that they have taken from, uh, at the beginning of the year. So has that happened in the past where, um, and how far back can we go, where a student has left, you know, the uh, um, Hillsborough County Schools, and then returned, but we haven't um, received their money back or their funding back to us. Um, that shouldn't happen if we have count. We have a count week where mm -hmm. we, um, if they are present at count week, then they're counted as Hillsborough students. What if they don't make the count week? And yeah. Then they're not counted. We don't get their funding. Then the count week coming in February, then we pick them up again. So through that calculation, we have students that, um, that let's just say, that come to us after the October window. Mm -hmm. And that's the FTE count week that we identify and they use as a marker in the Department of Education for us to identify our enrollment. If we have students that come after that and start at a different location for educational services and they come after, we don't get the funding for that particular time. So this is where we get to a point where we're serving, we'll continue to serve children. That's our role and responsibility that we don't have any funds attached. And some of the students may have different uh, adaptive needs that, um, that we have to go and spend uh, internal money on to be able to serve that student until we come back to February, which is the next week, to be able to identify that individuals in, within our school district and be able to validate their services in time to be able to generate funding for, this, for the next calculation. Because that does happen. Happens a lot. You know, that happens a lot where um, the schools will wait until that count week and then, you know, um, send a, the student out of their schools. And, you know, we need to start really looking at that issue and and start targeting these, these schools or, you know, really identifying these schools that do that, um, you know, to our students, where they capture the, the funding and the students out of the school. But thank you. Thank, that's the question I had. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Gray? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, also, well, I, I have a little note to, to read, but I'm going to say this first. 
There was a lot of talk uh, among staff members this week uh, between myself, actually you, and um, many others on committees that we have. And one of the great things that's going on, you talk about sustainability, that, uh, and this was Ashley Capucci's remark just today, in fact, we don't want to use grants, Mrs. Gray, because we want to make sure our work can be sustained and permanent. And that is the, and this is in credit to you, Superintendent Davis, maybe Roe, but that is a huge credit because we're looking at funds now as sustainable, not just the grant, the big infusion. And I think that's a really good philosophy. Uh, it's a conservative philosophy, and I think it's sound. Now, the question I have, and the bothersome fact, which I guess annoys a few of us, but the, the reality is now in 2016, I think we had 159,000 that was remarkably lost to FTE from the charter school. Now, uh, 2021-2022, we're looking at uh, up to 6 million projected loss. My question is, this goes because we're losing kids to the charter schools. Uh, how does this affect our fund balance? And if I want you to feel comfortable, but you know, you mentioned it in passing, but will this, this is a sustainable loss. Well, um, we lose students to charter school that were actually Hillsborough student. Yes, we lose that per pupil funding of $7,706 per pupil. But if the students go to charter school before they ever, that's just a, I mean, resource we never had to lose. So it depends if they first time students, they came to Hillsboro and then they left us, or if they just students to choose to go to charter school, there is no re resource loss. So we wanted, we want all students to choose Hillsboro County's public school district. So. And, and I know we're doing a, a darn good job trying our best to think of all the ways, and I know Member Snively also agrees that we have to become more competitive, and we, we shall. But the reality is this is a huge deficit uh, that is sustaining every year. So I just want us to not lose they sight of that. they projecting just like we do. Charter school project their numbers, but in actuality it just doesn't happen come to fruition. Sometimes they over-project, and also... Sometimes they under project, so it depends on the fiscal year. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Member Gray. Uh, Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, I have some questions, and a lot of them I know the answers to, but I want to hear you state them because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in the public um, in regards to things. So you're saying we're in an operational deficit and we're spending more than we bring in. Correct. So is that all the way across the budget, or is that – in the general fund specifically that we're challenged and spending more than we bring in? Well, that's the only fund that we can't, you know, general fund is the only fund we're doing that because grant is restricted. We have to actually spend the money and pull it down, draw downs. Because I, ha I see a lot of people who will say, why do we pass some agenda items that might be high ticket items if we're in an operational deficit? And they don't understand how some of the items are categorical and we can only spend those in those categories specifically. So what we're really talking about when we're talking about the operational uh, deficit is a general fund. And can you tell me what a majority of our, gen of our general fund, what our uh, expenditures is? 89% um, is on personnel. Okay. And so if we're in an operational deficit specifically mostly around personnel and we're spending more than we bring in, is that to say that the state is not giving us enough money for our operational personnel? I think that's a trick question, but. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I answer that one through the, through the chair. I think it's, I think it's multifaceted, yeah. uh, you know, coming in. I, I, there's always definitely a, a need for additional funding from the state to be able to put on the BSA, the, you know, the BSA to be able to allow us to be able to serve children in Hillsborough County to their unique needs. And at the same token, uh, when I came in, we did the analysis of multiple counties related to the Big Seven and did see that there was an inflated number of employees, not only at, and, and this is not directly at the school level, but the district level as well, and we've done our analysis to be able to do and put systems and processes in to really put and determine the organizational impact of every hire. So now if there's a, a, a major process that cabinet members have to go through to be able to validate any hire, 
in order for us to be able to make certain that we approve it or not. And the majority of our hires, when you have the conversation with Cabinet again on Monday, we're just not in a position where we can move forward. Anything that's not mission critical related to general fund, we just won't put it in place. So we've looked at some things, we've tightened our belt, we've made, we've made some adjustments, but we're still, even with those tightenings, which we can see in our schools every single day, what that's equated to, not having enough teachers to cover resources, to break up fights, to have them in PE, based on what the state says we need allocated, we're still in an operational deficit. One of the other questions I have is, why when t property taxes raise, does that not just cover it? There's reports that property taxes are bringing in billions and billions and billions of extra dollars. Why does that equate to our operational budget having more revenue and going up substantially? We do go up, we, we increase, but then there is a proration by the state of our per pupil allocation. So they don't allow us to take full advantage of no. property taxes. No. They cap that on how much we can put towards education. That's correct. For our operational expenses. And okay, so, now we're saying we've tightened our belt. We see what that looks like in our schools. Most of our teachers who come and, and speak say that we're understaffed. We don't have enough resources. Many parents are complaining about that. That's based on the state allocation, what they say that we should have staffed in our schools. And we're still in an operational deficit at this point. So what are our options aside from more cuts, um, the state actually giving us the funding that we would need to support our students and our schools at the way that our parents who choose traditional public education expect, that's their parental choice, or to talk about actually instituting a millage in our county to sell fund, which if I'm not mistaken, a lot of other counties do. When we talk about the difference between other counties, which a lot of constituents compare us to, why doesn't Orange County have this problem? Why do other counties have this problem? Because what it appears like is we're mismanaging funds and we're overspending due to our decisions as a board is because they're self-funding. So am I clear in understanding that either we need to change more up, make more operational changes if we have a deficit, expect the state to properly fund traditional education, or ask our voters to self-fund it since the state isn't making that a priority in the way they expect and do a millage. Is there anything else that you see as an option when we're talking about our operational deficit? No. Uh, thank you, um, Superintendent Davis. All right, and through that, um, through the chair, Mrs. Vaughn, you know, and we realized this, and, and we went through this last year, a very painful process, uh, I can tell you, as superintendent leading this process. You know, we were over $140 million at an operational deficit, and, and within one calendar year, we've cut that in half. And, uh, you know, with that said, we're, you know, one of those strategies is going to have to be in place, uh, whether it's uh, continuing to look at, uh, you know, so you, does the school have enrollment to be able to generate the services needed? Do we, we look at that at, from the district level, anybody outside of schools? Is it, do we need the position as attrition takes place? Um, do we uh, look at additional revenue streams to be able to compensate and be able to serve our children in, who have unique needs of any other county throughout the state? And you look at, as you said, other school districts such as uh, Orange County, such as Pinellas County, Miami-Dade, all have different half cents and a lot of the, some of them are linked to being able to properly incentivize staff Why others may be able to provide ongoing uh, resources specials and services um, internally to be able to make certain they're holistic thank you thank you superintendent davis yeah. member snively thank you madam chair uh, thank you miss johnson for your um, budget amendment report um, you know the, 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 the PowerPoint presentation that you had with the screen, I think it was the last screen where you kind of made the columns about how certain types of revenue and expenditures either create an uh, increase or deficit. That's very, that's very helpful. Um, there's, you know, probably one obvious one on there that doesn't get real specific uh, example of what that might be, but I'm pretty sure we all can figure it out. It's salaries. Right, um, but I will say this: uh, I agree that our state does not fund edu our public education properly. I think that as a board, um, what we can do, what when I talk to my state legislators, who listen very patiently about the concerns we have when it comes to funding, uh, they want to know that we are operationally efficient. And I think if we can show them when whatever that looks like, and that might be something that Ms. Davis 
helps us with, with um, you know, the team with, with Ms. Johnson, the superintendent, your team. But when, when they ask, you know, well, what do you need? How much does it, co will it cost? Uh, what is the, that number that you need? We have to be able to tell them exactly what that number is. And we have to show them and build the confidence that we are spending the taxpayer dollars wisely. I don't know if a, uh, you know, going out for um, another referendum is palatable to this school district, the, the taxpayers in the school district. Um, from what I gather from those constituents that, that share their concerns with me, there's not an appetite for it in the area of District 4 that I represent. I'm not saying that that's everyone. I'm just saying the people who, who reach out to me are, are don't, they just don't have the appetite for it. And so I don't know what that looks like with the, I can't speak for the rest of the board members and what their desire is. And that will eventually, I think, come about uh, with this board. But um, I think in the meantime, because even if something like that did happen and for some reason taxpayers did approve it, we still would not see the revenue coming in from that particular initiative for many, many months. And we still have probably, uh, we, still, we, we need CPR. That's, that's a longer term health plan and we need CPR. So, um, and I don't know that the legislature, even if they made significant changes would, would be timely enough either. So I appreciate the, what you're doing and some of the operational efficiencies that you've implemented. It's very significant from what I've seen pr from previous administrations, so I can appreciate that. But I think we're, we still have to get with the, our legislative partners and make sure they understand exactly what we need to fund our education here in Hillsborough County. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Member Snively. Um, and as we talk about the BSA, I mean, to, to increase by $6.25 last year, I mean, the rate of inflation in Tampa alone and rent, I mean, is astronomical. So, you know, when you look at our BSA and it's increased by, in the last 13 years, less, about $220 it's increased. I mean, how can we say we can show that our balance, that we're fiscally being responsible when we don't even have the money to maintain what we have now. So I guess I, one of the questions that I have is, are we tracking the number of students that leave the charter schools, the charter schools are getting payment from, and then they, they leave? Are we tracking which schools that's happening and when they're coming to our schools? Is there a tracking mechanism of that? And are we looking at the totals? Because that's really important. And can we do that? Because I think it's really important to see what's happening and for the legislature to see that if you have a child who's coming in and they have a lot of special needs and then you're, you're keeping them, getting the per pupil allocation, then sending them to our public schools and that child might need, you know, an aid on their own and we're paying for that. What does that look like? So I would like to make a request that we begin tracking that and we can probably go back and look at that in October. And we really need to track that internally because because I think that's an important message to the legislator for them to see. You know, for me with charter schools, I'm not against charter schools. My issue is that there's no oversight on the charter schools. And also that how are you making profit when the base student allocation is uh, a, a few thousand dollars? So that's my concern is how are you making profit from when, when you can barely pay for the bills right now? And, um, and so that's my biggest concerns. And can we look at that? Um, next, Member Holmes. Thank you, Member Combs. <clears throat> um, I want to dovetail a little bit on the comments from Member Perez and Member Gray around um, the calculations for school funding. Because I know this came up when we met with our local delegation. And it is something we don't really talk about too much um, throughout the year. But, you know, I mean, I've been in public education now for 30 years. So um, really how we calculate our funding has never changed, right? It's always been twice a year, fall and spring. And yet the landscape of education in our state has changed quite a bit with school choice, and that includes a lot of different options now. And so I think it might be um, something that we can do because we can't, dictate how many calculations there are. I mean, we can count, but the state's only going to look at 
twice a year. So, um, you know, we talked about it with our local delegation of maybe, you know, that system needs to, is really antiquated. It hasn't kept up with the changing landscape. And it might be good to, and I think there's a bipartisan appetite for this, to um, maybe put on our state platform next year that we want to lobby for an increase in the number of counts throughout the, the year so that we can capture those students moving back and forth, um, whether it's charters or they're new to the, the state or schools, you know, we want to capture, we want as many opportunities as possible. And we talked with our local delegation about, you know, money following kids. So that way when they leave a charter, um, that money follows them back. And, and you know, there was some um, bipartisan appetite for that as well. So I think next time we discuss our legislative platform, that's something, you know, and, and I bet other boards around the state would be interested in that conversation too. So, you know, just something to think about. Um, Ms. Roe Johnson, when we met for our one-on-one, -on -one, which I greatly appreciate, um, you showed me a slide that was, it showed the, the general fund um, with and without the transfers. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know if that's on here or if you have it tonight, but no. it's a, it, I, I would like us to show that moving forward because I think it's really important. And I know many of my constituents have asked for that because it is confusing when you show a general fund like we've been doing where a hundred million dollars have been, has been transferred out mm -hmm. onto other, you know, mm -hmm. onto ESSERS and it shows such a, a, you know, high general fund. And then it, it's very confusing to the public when we talk about, you know, our spending and our decisions around spending, like Member Vaughn mentioned, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would love that slide to be continually shown and discussed, because I, I do think it's important when we've transferred $100 million off. And then can you just run through the three or four ways that, um, that are part of the plan? I think one was, you know, do um, you want me to get back in the queue? Yeah, okay, let me get back in the queue and we can talk a little bit about that, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Member Hahn. Member Washington. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. You gave us a lesson today on finance um, because it's a lot you said that we really didn't know. And I hope the constituents also understood some of the information that you disseminated. How often do we report to the state Monthly. Monthly. Okay. So, so Ms. Johnson, when you're reporting to the state, just run us through that one more time. What, what, what's going on when you report? Um, the state is tracking our staffing as well as the budget amendments that we in our projections. So I do that cash flow projections. I know it's a busy, a very busy slide in the fine balance projections because the state have financial people and they understand that. They want to understand where we're projecting now. And I told them, as well as I, the community, I cannot do amendment of the budget until I actually do a movement in the budget. So until these revenue is realized, we can't do a change or, or amendment to that budget. Or until I we reduce, you know, move actually move eligible expenditures to the permanent move them to their funding resources, I'm not then I would do a budget amendment for that. So I don't do anything until we actually do something internally that triggers for us a reduction of expenditures or we get additional resource or revenue come in, then I do a amendment to the budget. So that is important for people, individuals to know. So we stay with the projection until it becomes a reality. Do, do they understand that? The state is aware of it, but they do always question us every month, you know, because they, I have to bring them in what my project, projected fiscal plan is. And I said, part of it is you guys to fund us for our students that, that we, you know, our actuals versus what we projected in our budget to true us up. And one other question. So what's the nominal length? Like if a kid leave us and go to charter school, because you know that tracking is a pain in the butt. I understand that. Mm -hmm. So when they leave and go to a charter school, okay, so how, and then they come back to Hillsborough County School, how long does it normally take for us to recoup that money? Um, they become part of our February count, but we really don't recoup the money until the next fiscal year. So we go a year, almost a year without money. Correct. 
Okay. Let me stop now. Okay. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Um, one thing I did want to point out as we're talking about the counts is we've talked about children who go back and forth from charter schools, but there's also a migrant population that I've addressed with Superintendent Davis where their agricultural season doesn't bring them into our district here until right after the count and talked about brainstorming ways to either put them virtually. I know hotspots and access technology is an issue, but somehow they are our students and getting them included in the counts because that is a, a substantial portion of our population. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was I appreciate uh, Member Snively's comments that the state, um, she agrees that we, we could use more revenue from the state. Um, what I'm challenged with is like you said, we have monthly reports that go to the state. They're monthly monitoring us. So they should know how much we're being underfunded and how much we need in order to properly fund our schools. And I understand that we constantly have this conversation that we're underfunded by the state, but until we can demonstrate more confidence with the voters financially, that we might be hesitant to ask for a millage. But what I'm finding for my constituency is a frustration that they're trapped in a limbo, that they chose to move to certain neighborhoods based on public education. That as their parental choice, they want to put their kids in a good public school and they bought houses and they made decisions and at the end of the day, they still have substitutes sitting in their class and not enough teachers and not enough supplies and they feel trapped in between the board and the state constantly going back and forth and saying, we're being underfunded, we're not getting enough money, but our voters haven't seen or that demonstrated that we have the fiscal responsibility to ask for it. And putting a millage on the referendum, putting it to the voters allows the voters to make that decision. It shouldn't be up to us to decide whether or not they can vote for that. It should be us, up to us to say, here's our problem, here's a solution. If Hillsborough County values public education and they want to do something that can allow the actual education that they expect in their schools when they send their kids, allow them to make that decision like they've done with, like you said, the half penny tax. We are not getting as many concerns and complaints about capital outlay because our county had to make the decision that we want to prioritize that and unfortunately self-fund that because it's not a priority with our state. I mean, we're looking at so many bills coming out of Tallahassee right now to limit school boards, take away school board salary, term limit us, um, you know, take away the authority of the school board, but not prioritize education and, and, and supporting our schools and our teachers who have been on the front lines this entire time. We asked them to come in in COVID and open schools for child care and had all these expectations of our teachers. And now that it comes time to show you, show them that we value them, we're like, sorry, the state is more interested in demonizing CRT. And I think that as a board, we have to make some serious decisions about this. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to... Uh, say in addition to um, Member Hahn's suggestion and uh, with more calculations uh, from the state opportunities, even though I know you report and chit chat with them every month, um, that would be a, a, an excellent choice or, or an excellent suggestion. It gives us more information, gives them more information, but better communication also uh, regarding Member um, <clears throat> Combs' suggestion of the tracking of charter schools students. Excellent suggestion. We did. We used to do that. We had it pretty much pinpointed uh, with the former CFO, but we can certainly get back. In addition, this is my suggestion because the, um, the Florida Department of Agriculture, I think it's that, we were listening to Shaney Hall. She said we may face no more um, food services for our students, uh, this, yeah, food services for our students, uh, which is very worrisome because that's a big battle right now. It's a lot of money. So what I'm going to suggest, uh, Ms. Johnson, and, and, and you did, your team did a, an excellent job, but also let us know what to look out for, you know, and, and I know Kristen does keep us informed, Member Vaughn, about our t salaries and all the catastrophic um, situations that are occurring to local school board uh, members, but we also, this is about our kids, and we also need to know what monies may be subtracted from the welfare 
of serving our children. Uh, and then when it comes to food security, that's huge. So that's just, I mean, my suggestion, and I know you'll do that, um, it will be helpful when we make further determinations um, because we have to be strategic in planning, as you well know, our revenue um, resources and expenditures. Um, so that would be the third, if we're counting up the third type of um, uh, memo to us. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Hahn. Thank you, Member Combs. Um, I just want to finish, close the loop on the conversation I started. Um, I mentioned the, the the two charts that you know demonstrated one with the transfers of 100 million and one without. And I think it's just I want to be really clear since we're you know constituents are watching and um, that we have moved 100 million dollars in expenditures to Essers, and we do have a fiscal recovery plan in place. It's it's obviously it's going to take at least two years to recover that money because it takes time when you move expenses. So so we one time did the move to Essers. Eventually that hundred million comes back. But we have a financial recovery plan and there's some things we're doing so that that hundred million is, you know, is not going to come back this it, and put us back to where we were a year ago. One was moving some approved expenditures to capital. Sorry, Mr. Farkas. <laughs> you built a nice little kingdom and we're coming for it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but, um, and the other was moving some of those, I think it was to Title, title One. Correct. Um, uh, some approved expenditures off to Title I. Some of this um, uh, natural attrition, we have lots of retirements and then putting mechanisms in place to make sure that when we rehire, it's absolutely what we need to strengthen our schools, et cetera. We're making smart choices when filling positions. Um, and then the fourth, there was a fourth one. I'm sorry? Our enrollment has increased. Correct. Okay. So. It's our hope if we really stick to this plan and then some other things that, you know, that are, are going to happen as well. In two years when Esther's is completely gone, we're not going to have that $100 million come back into um, the general fund expenses. And we will be in a better, I mean, I know it's more complicated than that, but I'm really trying to, to simplify it to demonstrate that there are mechanisms that we're putting in place as a board to make sure that when that when that one-time money is gone, we're, we're going to be in a better place than once we started. Yes, under the leadership of Mr. Davis, you guys are being fiscal responsible. We are doing things that's right by kids, right by this district, and we're going to come out of this operational deficit together. First, we need to clear the operational deficit where we have a plan that might clear it this fiscal year before we close out this year, and also we're going to move eligible spender to ESSER to increase our fund balance. Right. So we're going to be doing two things at the same time. And, and I think, you know, demonstrating and talking about these things at our meetings like this really is helping to rebuild that trust with us and our community and demonstrating, look, we're, we're trying to make good, smart, responsible fiscal decisions to get us back into more solid ground. Um, so, you know, I know we're, we're having lots of conversations right now with state funding and, and you know, it's kind of getting a little convoluted. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just, I really want to point out that, and if we could have moving forward those um, two charts showing the with and without the transfers to ESSERS, I think that would be helpful to constituents. Thank you so much. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Snively? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question about inflation and cost of living um, increases. And um, I, I, it's a little rhetorical because I think probably most people will know the answer to this question. But how does inflation impact how the legislature decides to fund public education when, for example, the IRS just increased COLA to 5.2? nine percent which I haven't seen it as an employer myself I have not seen cola jump 
to 5.9% in several, I don't know if I've seen it since I've been an employer for 20 years, uh, but it's usually around 1% or 2%, and it jumped to 5.9% this year. Um, how does that influence or impact our well, public we're education funding? The state um, allocate additional resource based on COLA allocation to the district because most districts, most state do that. When the COLA jumps, they um, allocate additional resource based on the COLA increase to students also. Have you seen that? I haven't seen that happen yet, but I know the governor is proposing a lot of things to increase our base allocation. That would be great, and that would be a, a change of tra trajectory for our budget also. I think that's something else that we can mention when we're visiting with our legislators as well, especially those who may not um, be privy to that information or be a, uh, a business owner or, or understand the um, how that impacts uh, businesses and institutions and municipalities across the state, um, just to remind them of, of that as well. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Snively. Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am, to the chair. And to speak about what um, the conversation related to the governor's budget, one thing we need to do when we transition to Tallahassee is try to get our legislators to support it because it brings, I think, close to $50 million back to Hillsborough County, and that will help us out tremendously. So just being able to support that budget, it's an aggressive budget. We appreciate it, and uh, we know that as session continues, some of that money may be chipped off. Um, but I think the other thing we need to do along with that budget is just ask for additional compensation for veteran teachers within uh, education in the state of Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C601. I have a motion by Member Hahn, and I have a second by Member Snively. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 602, increase the expenditures for mental health service with Central Florida Behavioral Health Network. Intent to negotiate. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, for the chair. This is to increase expenditures for mental health services with Central Florida Behavior Health Network. As we know, with uh, the last 22 months, we see that our students have continued to be faced with um, traumatic experiences and mental health issues that we want to be able to wrap our arms around them and help them be successful. So, uh, you know, when we look at these, when we look at the financial implications, in the last two years we spent close to $2 million with this partnership and we're asking for the come to the board to increase that by $1.5 million to $3.5 million. This is all directly linked to the number of referrals of mental health referrals that we are experiencing in our schools. If we look at it from last year, we had around 19,000 mental health referrals uh, for students to be able to provide services. Look at it to this year, we have over 100,000 mental health referrals to our clinicians to be able to provide ongoing services. So what this does is really allows us to be able to have, uh, to grow, you know, additional 89 sites to be able to serve our, our students to be able to help them through telehealth, family services, mental health services to allow them to be successful. And, um, you know, this is an expansion of a three-year agreement that was brought to the board back in December of 2018. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C602. I have a motion by Member Perez and I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do, thank you. Um, Superintendent Davis, since this is an increase of mental health uh, challenges um, and referrals, what I'm wondering is, is there any interest or in trying to figure out what's driving up the mental health challenges? Because, you know, I, I think you said, what was the, the difference in referrals number-wise between the two years? Yes, ma'am, 19,000 to 100,000. So that would indicate that we are having mental health crises, which we talk about quite a lot on the board. And again, my question is, is there funding or do we have the capability or the bandwidth as we expand these and respond to these referrals to figure out what's driving up and how we can address it other than, you know, just supporting the referrals? 
Yes, ma'am, through the chair, let me roll back and say that this money has all been expended through categorical funding, through mental health allocation, through the Department of Education, and this is what it's actually used to do. Through this process, we can determine whether or not uh, there's an opportunity for us to capture causation. Uh, I'll lean on uh, Mr. McCauley for that or Ms. Bayes for that to determine if that's, a, if that's something that we can capture. Um, to the chair, good questions, Ms. Vaughn. One of the things we have to recognize when we see increases like that is, one, just the availability and the um, advertising of that. So uh, since COVID started, we've been very aggressive with pushing out that kind of PSA that, that these resources are available, come see us. We're putting the resources in place. So um, while I think nationally we recognize there's a mental health crisis among youth, um, we also have to recognize that when we see jumps like that, a lot of it is just because of availability. So we've been aggressively saying, come see us, as opposed to not come see us. So that, that's something to consider when, when you um, look at numbers like that. So would you say doing a campaign of information for people to know what resources are available has yes, helped would naturally people increase those use, numbers, utilize yeah. the, the sources available? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Press. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, Academy, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American um, Academy of Pediatrics, and Children's Hospital Association declared a national emergency for children and adolescents' mental health. They said that this worsening crisis in child and adolescents' mental health was tied to the stress that was brought on by COVID-19 and the ongoing struggle for racial um, justice. And it also represented a trend that was observed prior to 2020. The rates of childhood mental health concerns rose steadily, and it was rising between 2010 and 2018, but also suicide became the second leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 10 and 24. These three groups aforementioned also went on to call for government and advocate interventions in 10 different items. But one of those 10 items um, in this group um, that they called for intervention in, and the third one listed was sustained funding for effective school-based mental health care. Um, our students here um, also um, are behind in their evaluations for their IEPs um, that would ass assist them with learning process, a critical piece in um, ensuring that our students have a secure foundation when not only do they start in their um, school education, but also move towards their future. You know, I'm excited as the mental health um, um, expert here on the board that um, the mental this mental health uh, funding services are being are being addressed today um, at this time um, but also um, you know the mental health of our teachers as well um, can be addressed with with this with this with this funding because our our teachers and our administrators are experiencing as um, also a level of um, mental health um, distress because the, the students' level of distress is also high. So I'm excited about this um, item being brought to, to us today. Um, thank you, Member Perez. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. We will now go to the employee comment. We will now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we are creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on their mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items. 
on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker will have three minutes. I will now call up the first speaker. Please state your name. Hey, good evening. It's Rob Crete, president of CTA. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Member Vaughn. I, I think you're, you're hitting on something that we need to really explore, and that if Hillsborough County is the uh, ground zero of what public education and the funding uh, shortages that we have in Florida are coming to a head, then we need to really uh, we need to share that with the state and with our communities across the state because we don't have those rich properties that other districts have. We do have, um, we don't have the millages that are happening. We don't have all the other bells and whistles to make uh, funding happen within our own district. And to, you know, the, the state is just not doing what's right. And we need to really highlight that, that our expenses are X and yet we're only collecting Y from the state. But let's take a look at really how we're doing our budget here as well. And um, thank you, by the way, Chair. Combs and Superintendent Davis for sending that letter today to the state. And you guys mentioned extraordinary circumstances that we're having here with our substitutes and COVID. And, you know, we're approximately 3,000 employees shy every single day. A year ago, we, we, we excised about 1,000 employees. We know we have 1,000 employees that we're looking for. And then we have about 1,000 employees out every day with COVID. And yet we're still trying to meet the needs of the kids. So... We need to be uh, aware of that and that the extraordinary circumstances, I think, is a very kind way of saying that it's really awful out there. And they're still trying to do everything they can every single day, and they're losing their minds, uh, quite frankly. The kids are, to, to the point that you made, uh, and so are all of the adults. So we really need to come together and figure something out here around that. And I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Johnson for uh, the presentation today. And... Uh, I appreciate you mentioning the recommended versus required uh, amount of money that needs to be in the fund balance. I've spent time here at, you know, uh, at board meetings railing against fund balances because it's absolutely ridiculous that in a state where we're hardly given any money, but you have to snuggle some away under the mattress to make sure they're for a rainy day. Let's not even worry about recommended because we can make a lot of recommendations to Tallahassee ourselves, couldn't we? So let's look at required. And then you had a number that was like 54 million, but you're like, well, that's not really the number. It's really 18. I promise you that if we, if we have $54 million in the fund balance, they're going to leave us alone. Okay. Look at what happened in Jefferson County. The state came in, they took over three schools and they failed miserably. They can't do it better than what we're doing here, the better than you're doing, better than we're all doing. So let's not pretend like they're coming for receivership. Let's stop talking about that here and now because that's ridiculous. But then I also want to talk about recurring expenses. Employees are not recurring expenses. They're expenses. Yes, it costs money to have a teacher and to have a parent, to have a superintendent. If I'm a recurring expense, then so is Mr. Davis. He's a recurring expense. So let's stop calling what we do and how we do it as recurring expenses. We're not. I'll, I'll finish real brief. I'm sorry. I know I'm being ding. But hey, here we have Teach in Tampa and we have the salary schedule for teachers. Okay. That's what teachers earn because when they are effective and highly effective, and, by, and quite frankly, they're not earning enough. But let's not say that this is a recurring expense. We want recurring teachers, don't we? We're going to need more recurring teachers, more recurring employees. So let's look at it through that lens as opposed to dollars and cents and how they're costing us, uh, costing us money. They're saving you money. They're the biggest bargain in Hillsborough County. So... We do it better here than they could do in Tallahassee. Let's remember that and let's fix it here and let everybody know how crappy it is for what they're doing down, you know, Tallahassee and doing to us up there. All right. So thank you. Let's work together and let's get this thing settled at the contract so we can all get together on this. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, school board, superintendent, and everyone who braved Omicron to be here this evening, and the hundreds, if not thousands, of people that have started to just watch the board meetings. Heidi Glick, Alonzo High School. Uh, but not only am I a teacher, I also live in Hillsborough County. I vote in Hillsborough County. I am a constituent of yours. I am a stakeholder of yours. And I want to know what's going on. 
My topic is negotiations, or actually the lack thereof. To quote your letter, Mr. Davis, great letter, by the way, Nadia, great letter. Uh, commendable work of our teachers. Monitoring, progress monitoring is trending up. We urge you to champion teacher compensation for our veterans, particularly given the monumental task of classroom teachers across the state performed daily under extraordinary circumstances. This continues to be the most challenging years for our teachers and our support personnel who have worked tirelessly to create a world-class education. I agree with that, totally, 100%. 110% then prove it, okay? <clears throat> it is February, we do not have a contract. When we all came back in August, we automatically finished a whole year of service. It should be automatically done. No negotiation needed, no nothing. We come back, we're on the next step. And the negotiation should be what we're adding to that step and what we're adding to the top. I'm exhausted. I teach five preps. I cover classes when asked, not just in my department, but in the rest of the school. And not just me, I mean everybody. Everybody at Alonzo, everybody at every other high school, every other middle school, it's exhausting. You have teachers on T-Pay, you have teachers doing ELP payment. We don't, we're not, we're just not making it. And I have friends, um, I used to work three jobs. I don't work three jobs anymore, thankfully, but I'm very fortunate to not have to do that right now. Other teachers are not so lucky. We. And it's, you know, I hate to say it, I've said it before, put your money where your mouth is. We're working our butts off, you guys. We are really, really are. Our kids are doing well, they really are. And I agree, the mental health of teachers, we're all falling apart. You know, um, I don't drink. I'm allergic to alcohol, I seriously don't drink. But we have happy hour on Wednesdays now because we can't wait till Friday to just to get together and have a good time. And ever since COVID started, all these studies have come on out that have said, Happy hour needs to be on Wednesdays. So you guys are can come to my house tomorrow because it's at my place. But I don't have any alcohol in my house because I have a dry house. I just thought I would tell you that. So you'd have to bring your own. Okay, bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Carissa Denica. Um, so uh, I first want to say that I am a teacher, obviously, but I'm also a parent of two children who go to uh, Hillsborough schools. Um, I am a graduate of Hillsborough schools. I've been in this system for a long time. And um, I wish I could go back to pretending I didn't know about all of this, but I do. Um, like Heidi said, we receive appreciation emails that acknowledge all the work that we've done, and frankly, it leaves us in a, this paradox. If you can see the good work that we're doing, why are we at the end of January at a standstill at the bargaining table? Have we not earned it? I did a little math recently. I'm a math teacher, so it's kind of what I do, but uh, I was doing it for fun. Um, the greatest step increase on that list that um, Rob gave us is about 4.5%, which is less than that in inflation rate that we all know of. The median step increase is 1.5. Myself, I'm looking at, I'm hoping for a 1.8%, less than $1,000 increase. If bargaining isn't completed soon, you're going to see more teachers leaving. You're going to see the veteran teachers leaving um, that know that, uh, like myself, I'm asked to be a teacher leader. If I'm being asked to be a teacher leader, then you, because of my years of service, then how can you do that without paying for those years of service? Now I know that we're told that there isn't enough money and I always like to give solutions, possible ones, but beware, uh, I grew up real poor, so these are probably real rough uh, ideas. One, uh, move all the district personnel to different school sites that have room. We've been told that there are schools that are halfway empty, a third of the way empty. They can go ahead and uh, do that. We can also have all the meetings since we are a Microsoft district and we have teams. We, that's, that should not be a problem. Uh, two, we can make sure that no money is given to decorate. I know a few years ago there was a big issue with decoration costs. Three, we can leave ROSAC and uh, lease, excuse me, lease ROSAC and the ISC buildings, since all those personnel are not going to be there, and earn money within that. 
And then uh, ROSAC, obviously this is an issue with school board meetings. We can move them from high school to high school in those auditoriums. Will it be difficult? Yes. Will there be issues? Yes. But frankly, there are however many teachers in this district that went and did that same exact thing and went through and did this digitally on a whim. I think we can do that too. I don't know if that's going to solve the world for us, but it sure would put a dent in it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, uh, Valerie Chuchman. I'm going to start with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. He said, action expresses priorities. People prioritize what they value. Right now, the teachers and support staff of Hillsborough County Schools don't feel valued. Not only is the contract not settled, but you guys haven't even come together to consider our proposal from November. People make time for their priorities. By delaying your executive session to discuss that contract proposal, the message that you're sending to the people in our schools is y'all don't have time for them. The employees have made the children of this district their priority. But all they've received in return from this room are excuses and platitudes. Last meeting, we heard that you guys need to keep the lights on. Well, do you know who are truly worried that they may not be able to keep their lights on? People who care for the students of this district every single day day. Please prioritize them. Come back to the table with an offer, a real offer that includes our earned year of service. Because if you all mean what you say, you will find a way. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, my name's Marie Masfer. I'm the Library Media Specialist at McFarland Park Elementary. My principal would like me to remind you we are the number one magnet school in America. And I'm the, <laughs> I'm the 2021 recipient of the Florida Power Library, which is a personal goal of mine. And another reason I'm here in Hillsborough County. Unlike many of the other speakers, I actually do not live in the county, which is one reason I'm here. Um, I appreciate your concern and what your discussions are. I please remind you, the governor is sitting on a pile of millions in federal COVID relief. And also there are lobbyists from other counties, Manatee County being one, who actually received funds to handle the compression issue. So in Manatee County, the um, experienced teachers do not have that problem. They, were, they received that and they received it from the state. But it was cherry picked because Bill Galvano was was Senator, was the, um, oh, I'm forgetting my name just because the name came up, but he is a Manatee County native and, and he helped those those funds come through through their lobbyists. So I, I was a classroom teacher in Manatee County and a media specialist for 12 years. I love that town and the island, which is one reason that I have not left, but the district canceled my steps and I was making the same amount of money. I found a 10 year old contract and had the exact same amount on it. And I said, this is ridiculous. So as you look, to balance the budget, I encourage you to remember the kids won't wait, the teachers can't wait. So in Manatee, their decision at that time seemed a small uh, budget issue that they could cut the budget, but the children paid dearly. In just five years, Manatee County went from 15th in the state. No Title I school was less than an A when I arrived in, 20, in 2005. And in five years, they went to 45th, 41st in the state in reading. And so depending on your decisions here today, it could happen here in the near future. So I brave the Skyway every day. I go 50 miles from door to door, but not just for the compensation, but my students. And as I was standing in line, I just remembered, um, my students have had art about three times this year. Um, lack of substitutes. We have an art teacher that, that, has, um, that has health problems and so our music and art education has been suffering this year with the split and and the decrease in our specials teachers 
So I am here for my students as well. But I am here to remind you that one reason I chose Hillsboro, I could have easily gone to Sarasota. Sarasota would have put me on step six after 20 years in education. So Hillsboro supports many programs that are recognized outside the state in the United States, but those can't happen without quality teachers. And so what seems like a small decision to save money can be an enormous impact on our classrooms. So I ask you to please choose HCTA's contract recommendations. I ask you to decide in favor of our children. And I ask you to ensure the future of our classrooms and continue the path of excellence here in Hillsborough County. Without quality teachers, our children suffer and our culture will change drastically. If you don't think your teachers will leave, I'm proof that they will. Thank you. Um, thank you. We will go back to 602 because we need a, a motion and a second for 602. I have a motion by Member Perez and I have a, a second by Member Washington. We will now move on to, yes, we need, do we have to vote again? Okay, and then we will also vote on that. I know we went over that, but we didn't have the motion or the second. So please vote when your lights appear. Yes, we've already discussed it, so we're just going to re-vote. So it passes unanimously. Now we're going to move on to 605, submission of grant application by the Grants Research Operations Office between January 25th, 2022 and December 31st, 2022, and accept awarded funds, the Federal Program Grants and Administration. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mayor, for the Chair, this is an opportunity that we bring to the Board annually at the same time for us to get permission to go out and seek competitive grants and other grants within uh, throughout the state and throughout the nation. Historically, it usually takes between 30 and 45 day uh, calendar that the grants are open. And that process being able to bring to the board, we may miss out on particular grants. And as you know, we go out to get uh, seek grants. And let me tell you, our grant team is exceptional in Hillsborough County. It's the best I've been around. Uh, Lisa Placo and her team are, are awesome. We, they go out for professional development grants, uh, SEL grants, uh, DODEA grants, mental health, STEAM, STEM, and also um, academic enrichment grants. So, um, you know, last year, you know, we were at $188 million for grants, and this year we're around $221 million. And then we will continue to move the needle related to competitive grants at $1.8 million. So just, just to get permission for the board, anytime that we will win a grant, obtain a grant, we will inform the board. And any expenditures linked to that particular grant, that will come in front of the board once, once we are awarded, if we are awarded. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C605. I have a motion by Member Washington and I have a second by Member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to highlight this because I think it was interesting that the, the gap analysis originally, I mean, it talks about how we're ranked 43rd in other states and that we're relying on these grants to try to even fill in gaps left by the state and local funding. I mean, it says it right here in front of us. And I consistently have constituents ask me, are we going out for grants? Have we looked at grants? What are we doing about grants? So I thought it was really important to highlight this in response to show that we are aggressively looking at grants and trying to capture every penny that we can when it comes to grant funding so that our constituents understand that, yes, absolutely, while Member Gray said that they may not be the most sustainable source of funding, that we are you know, doing everything that we can to capture every penny of funding to support our schools. So I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Hahn? Uh, thank you, Member Combs. Um, yeah, I just want to continue the conversation. And I do think um, grants also allow us to try some really innovative things and pilot some things that, you know, inform what we're doing across our schools. So, you know, we have to balance that with making sure that when the grant sunsets, then, every, you know, we if we don't have a way to sustain that, then it, it does sunset. But I agree with Member Vaughn. They're, you know, they're important part of the work that we do. They're not, it's a very competitive process. So when we do get awarded grants, I just applaud everybody involved because I know working in that world through USF, how competitive that process is, and it does help us really stand out as a district. So thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Snively? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will echo the sentiments of Dr. Hahn when she says it really can 
set our district apart with innovation and um, technology and creativity. And so I applaud um, our grants folks have been fa fabulous for years. They've really, really done a great job. We used to have a, um, and I'm guessing it's probably still out there somewhere, a spreadsheet that had our grants um, organized on it, like what were kind of the, the, the status of each grant um, and where, what it, you know, what it paid for, how long it was, how much it is, you know, th that type of thing. And because there is, you're right, there's not a guarantee that it's going to get renewed after, if it's a three-year grant, that it's going to get renewed in three years. But it's good for us to know, I think, as board members, what's out there, what, um, how much of the revenue coming into the district is grant funded, and um, what, what it just, you know, is more transparent so that, you know, not uh, Ms. Vaughn pulled this item to highlight it and make sure that people could see that, you know, we're doing this and it would be even more wonderful if that attachment was, was on it so people could see how many we're doing and how much it, it's bringing into the district. And um, if, uh, so I would make that request is maybe we can get that, that spreadsheet back in, um, in, in our hands and show us the status of those grants. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Moving on to 606, increase in expenditures for piggyback. 21139 PGB PP classroom instructional materials supplies and equipment catalog um, discounts superintendent Davis will highlight this item yes ma'am this is to bring to the board to ask for an increase of expenditures related to classroom material supplies and equipment related to catalog discounts uh, we piggybacked back in um, November of 2021 uh, off of no, uh, Hernando County and this is all to be able to put additional supplies to Irwin Technical College related to supplies equipment related to HVAC nursing um, massage therapy and now we transition to have additional money through workforce development to be able to transition and, and have uh, greater resources for the electricity electrical um, pathway so this is allow us to to increase the electricity career certification program and really allow our students to be exposed to energy standard uh, training simulations and student curriculum to allow them to be successful Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-606. I have a motion by Member Washington, and I have a second by Member Gray. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, and I'll try to make it brief. Um, Superintendent Davis, I've had some questions regarding our piggyback agreements. I've actually had a lot of questions. I don't know if the board has any interest in eventually having a workshop around it. I don't know if we can put it on, on, the, to on the topics and poll members. They might not have any interest. But uh, people have, concern, have addressed concern to me that when we're using piggybacks and we're bypassing our local workforce to get a better rate because we do have such a financial crunch, when we um, identify, you know, how many of the curriculum that we would need for this piggyback and we go out, when we come back and you ask for additional money on that, is that just because we underestimated our student enrollment? Is it based on underestimating how many pieces we would need or has the price gone up? I think people are concerned that we're going outside of our county and we're making agreements for, uh, for a lower rate and then we have things that come back and we ask for more money on that piggyback and people just want to be understand that we're not bypassing our local workforce and giving more money to people outside of our county for these contracts. Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am, to the chair. It's a good question. And, and we've had a conversation uh, this week related to, and particularly maybe last week, related to piggybacks. And I've asked my staff to, to be very thorough related to when we bring piggybacks to the board and to identify how that piggyback potentially is saving us money related to the current price that's uh, been, been extended to potential awards. But related to this particular item, we just had additional grant funding related to workforce development through the CARES 3 grant that um, we were able to not only to go on and serve additional pathways through uh, Irwin Technical, but when the additional money uh, arrived through our budget, we were able to look at the electricity side of the, the college. So being able to expand this to be able to serve another pathway for our community. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Member Gray? So I'm kind of glad you uh, pulled this, uh, Member Vaughn, because it gives uh, the superintendent at least a, a little opportunity to uh, uh, share the expansion of our vocational technical programs and the eclectic nature uh, that we're really diving into with these piggybacks. Um, and it, I think yeah, I heard massage. Did you say massage therapy is one of the? Yes, ma'am. So, um, you know, this is the, this is the country and this is the uh, county that, uh, and this is the school district that w will afford and give the opportunities for all types of vocational opportunity and uh, diversity. Uh, so at any rate, um, I'm sure we'll share more about the huge initiatives that you'll be doing with the workforce. So that's all. Thank you, Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 608 Piggy Bank Enterprise Resource Planning System. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. 608 is a piggyback for our ERP system. Back in uh, 2017, the board approved the transition to our ERP. With that is to be able to look at all of the software management to really help us have uh, more sophisticated software to be able to serve us through human resources, through our finances, and um, to be in through all the logistics related to this work. So in this ERP system, it's major for us to make certain we have conversion of all of our analytics, all of our data, all of our processes to make it uh, make sure that we are fluent. Because if this ERP conversion is not done with the delicacy and the attention needed, it will potentially hurt us in so many different um, avenues. Um, so what we're looking for today is being able to come back to the board and ask for a $1.3 million increase in services through our consultant of Infor. They bring a, a team of specialists, of, an, of experts, analysis experts, program specialists to be able to help us aid in our data conversion, alignment to our processes with IT, human resources, and financials. And um, uh, through the chair, I'd like to give this to uh, Dr. Weeks to be able to provide any additional um, information. Yes. Um, I would like to point out that uh, for the district moving forward, um, as Superintendent Davis had stated, that this is a critical item that uh, we need to uh, move forward on. We do have a specific deadline that is looming in front of us, um, and the existing system that we're using is about to go completely out of service. We've been working on this since 2017, as Mr. Davis had stated. Um, this funding will be used to allow us to push towards um, the implementation, the final implementation of the product. This will take us through the remainder of this fiscal year. Um, that expenditure will occur out of general funds. However, that will be restored by capital funding before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, I'm told somewhere in the June timeframe. Uh, and I'm told because of the type of expenditure it is that it initially needs to be incurred through the general fund, uh, which is why it does not uh, impact the, or it's why it needs to go directly to um, general fund and not capital, so. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-608. I have a motion by Member Perez and I have a second by Member Snively. Any discussion? Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Weeks, for clarifying that although this is a general fund um, expenditure, it will be coming back. You're, you're saying that's, I heard, I've been told most likely by June, but I just want to clarify that by the close, this will be restored from capital outlay. Is that correct? Ms. Johnson? That's correct. Okay, because I just want to kind of clarify going forward for general fund expenses, you know, until we really restructure our operations, um, our operation budget that I can't in good faith, even for things that we need, uh, vote for things that come out of our capital fund, you know, until we're able to support and pay our, our staff and our teachers a livable wage. So I just want to be clear on that. So I'm voting for this because we are getting reimbursed. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? Thank you, Madam Chair. What, once this is taken out of our general funds, what is it, our general funds going to look like? How is it going to impact? Uh, Ms. Johnson? It's been a 
a general fund, but we'll do a transfer from the um, capital to cover the spins. So our general funds will not dip down? That's what I'm asking. Superintendent Davis, were you going to answer that? Yeah, I'll let Ms. Johnson through the chair. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson. Up. Initially, our general fund would um, be a reduction because it's a expense to the general fund. But before we close out, that transfer would happen to cover that expense. It would dip down by how much? Uh, the cost of the item that's up before the board. How much is that? Three million dollars, roughly. Do we have any more questions? Member Gray? Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, and Mr. Weeks, I know that you spent time with the board members explaining this necessity um, that we get this, uh, we must have it updated. And I am reminded just the, uh, in, on behalf of the teachers, if they don't have that software that's up to date, and uh, staff members, cabinet members, if we can't get our uh, technology up to a point of, uh, let's just say, normalcy, um, then we're going to fall behind, not only academically, socially, and mentally. We have to have an update. Um, and Mr. Weeks, I want to thank you for putting this together. I can't hardly see you, so I'm looking between the chairs. Um, and uh, I, I see it as a necessity to keep up uh, for the students' uh, welfare and uh, our, uh, as I said, the cabinet members and our principals. Thank you. Member Vaughn. Thank you, Member Gray. I appreciate that input, but I would just like to add a comment that if we don't have staff members because we don't prior prioritize them feeling valued and having a livable wage in our community, then there will be no one to use this technology other than cabinet. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Next is six. 10, increase in expenditures for invitation to bid on uh, school board's vehicle and safety vest steam cleaning. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, to the chair. In June 25th, 2019, the board approved an agreement to provide steam cleaning services for our school buses, for our vehicles, and also for our safety vests. And what we see due to COVID, we've seen an increase of um, a, a need for us to have greater cleaning. So bringing back to a board a, an additional expenditure going back to match the 2019-2020 year of $240,000. This will be spent in a split cost uh, through ESSER dollars and at the same token being able to, to leverage uh, general funds as well. But there's just definitely a need to be able to, to combat COVID to continue to clean not only the vests that individuals wear, but our buses and our vehicles that individuals drive and our students transition and our employees uh, transition in every day. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item six, C610. I have a motion by Member Gray and I have a second by Member Hahn. Any discussion? Member Perez? Why is it that we can't pull all of this out of um, ESSER funds? Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am, through, through the chair. Our, I mean, our ESSER funds have been identified as of right now. If there's a if there's an opportunity for us to go, we've expended the majority of them. We could, there's an opportunity to go and, and actually make an amendment, we will. But right now, to be able to make certain that we cover this expense, we had to be able to identify what was available through ESSER. The same in what wasn't available, we had to pick up with general fund and make it a reality. If we can go back and uh, create and process any amendments, we'll work with our team to see if that's availability to do so, and we'll keep the board, the board informed. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Vaughn? Thank you, Member, um, uh, gosh, Member Perez. I had the same question. Um, to follow up on that, um, because I think that's confusing to people because we got so much money, is that because we're taking this from ESSER 2 that was broken down into buckets and we've expanded as much as we can for that ESSER 2 bucket since we didn't get free access to the ESSER money and it was subcategorized? Mr. Farkas. Mr. Farkas? Just to clarify, the reason the original expenditure was from the general fund, this extension, this 
added money is actually through ESSER. So there will be no more money taken from the general fund. That's already been spent. So if we had to go back, we'd reclassify it. There's no more general funds being spent with this expenditure. It's only ESSER. The general fund was spent in the first part of it. This is needed to increase. That makes if that makes sense. So no money is coming out of the general fund when, if we no approve. No more it. money is coming out of the general fund. The original uh, approval for the steam cleaning was done out of general fund. This expenditure, this expansion or added funds, will all be out of ESSER. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two questions. One. Um, What's the breakdown of the the financial impact? Um, I know what I'm asking is, what is the 161,720 specifically paying for? Mr. Farkas, you have a breakdown of what that 161,000 dollars will be. Do you mean like what, how many buses it's cleaning? That part of it? Well, yeah. Is it is it the sanitation part? Is it the harness part? Is it the safety? The majority of it's the buses because we 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 actually steam clean the buses every. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is to, to make sure that we've got those clean because that's the one place we can't social distance. So a majority of it, I, I don't have the breakdown here, but I can get it for you. Okay. And then are um, school buses considered cap capital expenditure? Yes. So when you main, so we can we not use capital revenue to maintain capital expenditures? Why can't we use capital funds to maintain capital? That is a great question, but you cannot. The Assets. Are very specific. That maintenance is a non-capital expenditure. The school bus, mm -hmm. the expensive part, is a capital expenditure, but to maintain it has to be at a general fund. So, so is that, and that's decided by the legislature, correct? 100% of statute. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. I kind of knew the answer to that question too, sorry. But, um, but that's potentially somewhere where we could impact legislative change as well. So um, it, because there are, there are laws that are antiqu they're antiquated, and outdated some of them and and they don't apply the same way anymore and this is a perfect example of particular particularly you know anything that we purchase that be, it becomes capital uh, investment for our school for our schools and students um, that should be able to be maintained by capital funds as well but that's just my professional opinion and we can take that to the legislature too thank you member snively Please vote when your lights appear. That's right. <laughs> and it passes unanimously. 701 to approve the guaranteed maximum price, the GMP for the bus loop and parent pickup project at two sites, and that's Lamb and Progress Village, project number 100294. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. the Chair. This is a, to approve the a partnership with the county for a park and driveway accessibility for Lamb and Progress Village Middle School. For so many years, they've had uh, they've had problems with uh, the community of getting into these two uh, facilities and being able to exit. So the county is going to partner us to be able to uh, to address and rebuild their uh, pickup zone to re to eliminate traffic along with the bus tra uh, help with the bus traffic to be able to get our, our constituents and our students in and out of the, faci the both facilities in a uh, efficient manner. Thank you very much, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C701. I have a motion by Be Member Hahn and I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Superintendent Davis, I pulled this item because when I go to visit my schools in my district, a big portion of the concerns that I have from administrators are are outdated bus loops, parent pickup lines. The concerns are teachers are staying hours and hours and hours later to make sure that students get picked up in time. Um, and some of those, I know it's very complicated because some of that is federal highway property, some of it's county property, some of it's city property, some of it's our property. Um, but as the liaison who sits on the TPO board, I want to have more conversations going forward and invite fellow board members who have issues with schools in their districts with similar concerns about this. And I thought this was a good opportunity to have that conversation about, you know, moving forward if we can build more infrastructure to address and deal with a lot of these internal transportation problems that we have, whether it comes to the bus loop or whether it comes to to parent pickup because it's frustrating parents, it's frustrating school administrators, and I feel like that when I kind of dig, there's um, 
a gray area to use uh, words that uh, have been given to me between is it the county's responsibility, is it our responsibility, and whose responsibility. And I think we need to do a better job of addressing whose responsibility it is and really advocating to get these these problems uh, or these issues solved. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that and start having conversations about it because this is the first time I've seen something on the agenda that addresses some of those concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. We're now going to move on to Section E, which is the information items. First is 1201, the Financial Advisory Committee update. Ellen Lyons, Vice Chair of the Financial Advisory Committee, will highlight this item. Good evening, members. Thank you very much for inviting us, the uh, Financial Advisory Committee members, to speak with you tonight. This is Rick Warner, Chair of the Committee. I am Ellen Lyons, Vice Chair of the Committee. Uh, we're part of a committee of 15 members, some of whom are appointed by you and some appointed by community groups. Uh, you founded our committee in the summer of 2021, and the purpose is to help find solutions for the fiscal operational deficit, um, ensure transparency in budget and reporting, and provide guidance to the board. We can't make any financial decisions, but we can provide guidance to you and we can let you know about our progress, which is what we're here to do tonight. The operational deficit occurs because in 2022, this district is still getting per pupil allocation, base allocation, that's actually less than it was in 2006. Um, and so in the 15 years that have uh, transpired since the Florida legislature uh, drastically reduced peer pupil funding, the district is educating ever more students for still less money. And the uh, you know, long-term uh, impact of that has been a fiscal operational deficit. Um, it's a tremendous cost to, to uh, operate this district. That's what we've been learning during all of our meetings. Our committee has had multiple meetings and we've learned all about the district operations. We've created a binder that has a lot of really helpful financial information for our committee to use. And in one of our meetings, we asked our CFO, Romanier Johnson, and her staff to come up with a plan. We wanted them to pre pl uh, present a plan about how they can address the fiscal operational deficit in this year and potentially years to come. So CFO Johnson did present to our committee a plan and the plan seeks to greatly reduce or potentially eliminate uh, the operational deficit for this year. It won't necessarily be able to be replicated in future years, uh, but it is something that we as a committee, we were favorably impressed by this plan. Uh, we support the plan and we also support action to bring the budget into balance uh, as quickly as possible. So we wanted to let you know that we made a resolution that supports the plan. Um, there is a PowerPoint slide somewhere that's, uh, that has the exact language of our resolution. So the next thing that we want to do is research. Uh, we want to research several budget areas. Some of the things that we are going to do are going to focus on cost reduction, such as recommendations from the Gibson Report or Great City Schools. But we also want to look at additional sources of revenue for the district. Um, we want to let you know that we're working hard for our community and we want to seek feedback from you and any comments that you might like to take back, like us to take back to the committee. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any, are we going to allow comments? I forgot. Is, is there going to be comments? No. I think we said there were no comments. I want to thank you for all your work and your time and your commitment for you. And, and I know on behalf of the board, we want to thank all of you for doing this voluntary and doing all that you're doing to try to make sure that we get that information out to our community and also make sure that we continue to be fiscally responsible. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent feedback because I do think that we should be communicating this with our community and our groups that we are representing. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll email you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next is um, 1202, which is the State of Florida Department of Health in Hillsborough County School District contract to provide relief from impact of COVID-19, the federal programs, grants, and administration. Superintendent Davis, 
will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is just a, to recognize a collaboration between Hillsborough County Public Schools and the State of Florida Department of Health, enabled to bring to execute a contract in the amount of $828,000 to be able to reimburse, uh, you know, for staffing costs, for salary costs, for nurses, for PPE, and also be able to to help with with the with the dashboard. So, just collaboration continues to show that uh, we're working collectively to be able to remain safe and to be efficient with um, with our work related to COVID. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. We will now move on to our superintendent comments. Superintendent Davis. Yes, ma'am, through the chair. All right, Mr. Pablo, you ready? All right, so this evening we want to identify uh, a couple things to, within the presentation to recognize the excellence in education winners, to be able to highlight Black History Month activities. The board did a really nice job with the proclamation, and I agree, it's 365 days a year that we celebrate, uh, you know, individuals that have been the architects. Uh, of, of, of this great country, at the same time be able to update uh, some items on our consent agenda and then identify sales tax referendum expenditures and share proactive solutions that we're helping students be successful and be able to help uh, transformation. One of the things with goal three is exceptional talent to be able to highlight excellence in education. As you know, on uh, you know last week, Thursday, is my first day back out, we get a chance to, uh, to glow crazy and what an awesome event by Hef to be able to recognize not only the winners in Hillsborough County, but all of the individuals that were deemed, identified and nominated for, um, for three prestigious awards in Hillsborough County. I want to recognize uh, Domingo Mr. Lopez from Shields Middle School. He is our Ida S. Baker Diversity Educator of the Year. He gave a passionate speech uh, that evening. Uh, I know that I uh, thought he was going to get the gong, but he didn't get it. Uh, but uh, he did a really nice job, um, and he'll be recognized to represent Hillsborough County. Also, for the Instructional Support Staff Employee of the Year, Mrs. Smith at Temple Terrace Elementary School. She is a parent liaison aide. Uh, wonderful job in recognizing her efforts and her work. And then also the Teacher of the Year, Mrs. Laura Weiderberg from um, Armored High School, biology teacher. You know, all you know, anyone could have been a representative uh, for Hillsborough County, but these three individuals were recognized, and we celebrate them in a special night. And thank Hef and all of our partners with Suncoast and others in Caspers for really making this a special night. We really needed it, and we did it in a safe manner. And thank you to all of our attendees for recognizing the protocols in place to be able to attend the special event. Also, uh, you know, goal two in our strategic plan is all about supporting an organizational culture and celebrating black history uh, for the month of February. One thing we task our, our staff to do to recognize a theme in Hillsborough County Public Schools. And one of the things we recognize is, is a focus on black health and wellness and so really uh, pertinent related to COVID. Um, so they did a really nice job. Uh, so that is our theme that we will focus on. We're asking anyone in our school district who is uh, many, many activities that we will implement in our schools to use our hashtag HCPS Black History 2022 to share the school-wide activities, school-wide events on our social media platforms to show the concentration, the focus, and the celebration within our school district. Um, we've given a number of uh, teacher resources, accessibility. Thank you to um, Academic Services, Mr. Connor and his team, and really, really given us aligning not only lessons, but also aligning Mayan uh, readings uh, connected to black history, and then many, many school district events that will happen from contests to spotlights to essays to art events to recognizing one individual per day to online classrooms and, and also being able to identify pioneers who've worked and changed the work in a proactive solution way in healthcare. Um, so what we'll see in our events is you'll see a power hour of, of uh, webinars, the spotlight, uh, black history, uh, individuals who've made impact on health and wellness. We'll also have read-ins and read-alouds with, um, with uh, elected officials, with cabinet members, district members, school board members, and also a number of tours and family resources that we will acknowledge and celebrate. So, you know, thank you for our team for making this a priority. It's a reality within Hillsborough County, and we'll continue to acknowledge and celebrate uh, the rich history of Black History Month within our school district. And then also, one thing we always talk about is academic excellence. And uh, tonight, the board had, we, we presented to the board through the consent agenda 501 through 505, which really signifies how our students are, are competing at a, at a national scale. And so many of our 
our, our choirs, our chorus, our bands, or, and our magnet students are, are going all across this country in a safe manner with parent permission mm -hmm. to be able to go and compete. And uh, we bring that to the board for recognition and celebration. And then also we had a uh, yeah, tonight through Consent 603, which is our expansion of our agreement with Workforce Development Partners for Future Career uh, Academy. They did a really good job in Plant City over the last year in, with four schools. And we really wanted to highlight that with Yvonne Fry and her staff, you know, really having a greater partnership with our workforce development and expanding it from four schools to ten schools and really leveraging workforce dollars and Perkin dollars, which are categoricals, to be able to help our students find pathways in uh, internships, uh, you know, apprenticeships, create videos to illustrate the jobs that are consistently out there in Hillsborough County that students can transition through and really allow them to leverage uh, opportunities through our English 4 classes that go on sites to learn more, more about workforce development and, and just to thank them for willingness to be a partner in our workforce development team for making that expansion. And then also sales tax. I would be remiss and uh, thank you to um, you know, our team, our, our community, uh, Citizens Advisory Community team for coming this evening and giving their your thoughts about how we can improve. And one thing we do in, is talk about transparency and trust. If we are, are going to seek an additional revenue stream, one way to do it is highlight what this executive committee has done for the sales tax ref referendum to be able to expend Hillsborough County funding in an efficient, transparent manner. To date, while this we have this community has invested over three hundred million dollars to Hillsborough County to address deferred maintenance, and tonight we bring another final acceptance to McKittrick Elementary School. But I cannot thank this com executive committee, the oversight committee, for doing this in a, a delicate, caring manner and being efficient in their work, and it's going to allow us to build that trust within our community. And then also finally bringing a suspended agenda to the board, Transformation Network. And I'm going to let Ms. McRae kind of talk about her work. And uh, they've been really laser light focused on uh, moving the needle for our, for our students, building the capacity of our, of our teachers and our parents. And I'll let her highlight what we're doing. Absolutely. Um, the last board meeting on December 14th, we were able to bring to you our uh, MOU agreement with our colleges and universities. Just wanted to share an update with you. Um, as early as this month, students came back from the spring, from the uh, December uh, winter vacation, the second week of January. So we have hit the ground running with getting, um, getting our advertisements out, and we have over um, almost 50 applications of students that are already saying that they want to participate. So we will start our first round of students going into our schools in the next week and we will continue to advertise and get the word out that we have opportunity for college students to come in and to help uh, tutorial have tutorial opportunities with our students uh, the next thing is we have our second year of our partnership with Microsoft Microsoft has an exclusive partnership with Hillsborough County uh, Public Schools and they have a vested interest in the transformation network they do have a diversity um, equity and inclusion division in Microsoft and they are targeting um, opportunities and experience for um, students in the Transformation Network to really uh, get information out, um, but to understand technology, uh, STEM, as well as educate them on, um, you know, African American history and other activities that they have. So we're going to be partnering with them ongoing, and this is one opportunity for Black History Month that they are doing exclusive programming for Hillsborough County with Transformation Network. Thank you, Ms. McRae, and we appreciate your leadership. And final one is, is creating that supportive organization. I know that we've, you know, since the last 22 months, we had a number of our students and staff members going through some really traumatic experiences, all linked to mental health. And one way, you know, we also have over the last couple of months, uh, some of our formal um, students and, and constituents come to talk about uh, potential issues that they have historically experienced. And I just want to be clear about how important this is to this administration to be able to provide ongoing supports and uh, that continues to link to support our, our schools to make them a, a, you know, a psychologically safe place and, and, and highlight a number of areas uh, that we are implementing. Uh, you know, hats off to the Office of Civil Rights and Compliance, FACE and Innovation for teaming together, being able to visit schools uh, that, that have identified there's a particular need and going out to provide uh, ongoing topics of professional development related to bullying, sexual harassment, mental health wellness, 
and really being able to highlight uh, accessibility through our practitioners and at the same time being able to identify how SEL curriculums are, are there to be able to build uh, the knowledge and the confidence of our learners every single day within our classrooms. Also being able to, to the, tonight, thank you to the board for being able to improve our, our partnership with the Central Florida Behavior Health Network. This once again allows us to move from 49 to 118 sites that will have more mental health therapists assigned to gain access to those who may be having any traumatic experiences. And then also being able to, at the district level, our district staff going out and meeting with school uh, governance, uh, school uh, mental health advisory councils, and also adult advisory councils to be able to identify what's working, what's not, what we can do differently, and have greater accessibility to be able to provide services. And um, you know, I thank you for our team. I know that uh, this team has continued to uh, partner and, and formalize our, our partnership with the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay. We are we are on the verge of trying to create an, uh, an aggressive messaging component that really talks about how we have students to have. Um, an opportunity to build relationships. We will launch uh, Hillsboro Assist. This will be forthcoming on ClassLink, which will provide information, which will provide resources and reportance and guidance to students who may need uh, additional assistance through um, any bullying, harassment, sexual harassment, and that will be linked into uh, an immediate link on uh, ClassLink for our students. And at the same token, we want to continue to make certain that we uh, you know, highlight the relationship that we have with our crisis center of Tampa Bay. And if anyone has any potential um, needs, please call 211. This, this, the crisis center, the center of Tampa Bay is there to support, and they will engage us as needed to be able to create um, better comfort every single day within our classroom. And thank you, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. We will now move to our board comments. Um, board members, just a reminder that you'll each have five minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Um, Member Hahn. Thank you, Member Combs. Um, first, I just wanted to congratulate all the winners of the Excellence in Education Awards. Um, I, it's the first year I missed, and it was I was recovering from COVID, and I'm sorry I missed it. It's actually my favorite event of the year. Um, but I followed closely and really enjoyed um, looking at all the videos and highlights, and it was a wonderful evening. I want to thank Anne-Marie Courtney, our very own Anne-Marie, for all the work she puts in to that event. Um, Kim Joel from HEF. We couldn't obviously do that event without our HEF partners and um, all our community partners for um, helping us support our teachers and recognize them for the tremendous job that they do each and every day. Um, also want to share uh, the Read on My on um, December data because it was really impressive. Um, over During December, remember part, half of that month was Christmas break and the holidays, and we had a, almost a half a million books accessed by our students during that time, and uh, over 53,000 hours of reading books. And the books are in both English and Spanish, um, so it's a wonderful assortment of, of books. And that was 10,000 more hours of reading in December than in November. So it really made, uh, as somebody, and I know many of all my board members love books and, and understand the importance and the correlation between the number of books kids read and their academic achievement, that it really you know, filled my heart with a lot of happiness to see that. A lot of time was spent over Christmas break reading good books. Um, I also want to congratulate Mayan. It's their 10 year anniversary that they've been in our community. And, you know, I, I, I do try and share the impact that Mayan has in our, on our students. And um, next, next meeting, I'll probably share a video that really um, highlights a lot of our community partners and folks in the community. Uh, congratulating Mayan, but you know, a lot. Uh, our partnership with Mayan is made possible by a lot of great community partners, like the Children's Board and our Early Learning Coalition, and and the Housing Authority, and a, a lot of great organizations understand how important and the impactfulness that that organization has on our district. The last thing I just want to comment on is something that was brought up during our uh, public comment, and it was around books. And it's been discussed, I think, at every board meeting for months and months and months now, 
And I think tonight, you know, two of the speakers really drove home the point and demonstrated articulately the correlation between pornographic materials and human trafficking and grooming kids and the mental health challenges um, that, that this has on our students. And I guess my question for the um, superintendent uh, is who is making the decisions to purchase books like the ones that have been discussed? And um, is that individual librarians? Is it staff? Is it publishers that we, you know, that are sending books that, you know, we have agreements with? I I'm just trying to wrap my head around where the, how these decisions are made, because I think it's important for our constituents to understand that. We're not, this board is not sitting here and rubber stamping books to go in libraries, but how is that happening, Mr. Connor? Mr. Connor? Yeah, through, through the chair. Um, that's a great question, and our media specialists have been um, trained extensively on that process, and they're trained pretty regularly about the selection process. And so typically our media specialists look to some of the best seller in some of the recommendations from Scholastics and, and other um, publisher. reading publisher list to make those decisions. Uh, but our media specialists, um, in, it, typically in, in what we're looking at <clears throat> as far as our speakers here recently, most of those have been library books. And so um, that's primarily selected by the media specialists. And there, is there a process that they have to go, to go through when they select books for their libraries in our schools? There's not a necessary a process, but they do. I mean, we have internal processes as far as purchasing those books, but they use those, those lists and they use our vendors to make those purchases. Okay, so they just get to choose individually what books go in each library. Okay, I just think that's important because this has come up now at every board meeting and um, I, I did not particularly really know if it was a staff level decision and every library kind of got the same books, every, every middle school, every elementary school, every, you know. So uh, I appreciate the, clar the information on that and um, Thank you so much. I appreciate the time, Member Combs. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Gray? <clears throat> and, and also, thank you, um, Member Hahn, too, about the books. I actually was uh, asking the various librarians how they were selected. And in fact, Mr. Connor, you're right on the dime. They, they decide in some of those books, um, teachers have actual lesson plans around, which is hard to wrap your head around, but that is the reality. Uh, they do choose those books. Um, uh, now, also, thank you, Superintendent Davis, for mentioning, again, our referendum committee and the monies that we get so Mr. Farkas can spend a lot of money on renovating the schools. And it is a good thing, and it's necessary, and they do a great job, all volunteers, um, led by um, the Honorable Betty Castor. Also, um, getting back to the black history, we want to thank, in addition to the, um, to the wonderful, um, uh, let's just say, leaders in the uh, black history world, is uh, Allison Edgecombe, who also um, has helped our task force um, bring about the Thurgood Marshall clubs in our high schools, along with uh, Mr. Connor. Uh, we are definitely, uh, and, and I know Allison is working hard to make that occur uh, in spite of this uh, virus, but we are, uh, and she is very, um, just very tenacious, and I'm, I'm positive it will be a very big success and a very important uh, uh, club to have at our high schools. I want to say also we appreciate uh, Toba and uh, James Ransom, the 34th Annual Breakfast with the speaker, Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver. Always great to be inspired and uh, really um, giving us great insight into the, into the needs of the black communities. Uh, and it's, it's just so important that uh, every year that all the board members do attend, as we always do. Uh, also, uh, since I'm saying also, let me just change that to say in addition, um, I didn't know this, but BayCare has uh, trained over, and I have it down here, 9,000 of our students in CPR, because I was wondering where um, Colette was, uh, O'Keefe, 
And she said, Lynn, I've been busy training all these students for CPR. So that's 9,000. That's quite uh, formidable. Thank you, Colette. Uh, I also want to say, and I didn't bring the watches. Uh, yes, I'm going to bring the watches for the Gasparilla 5K. Um, now it's January 26th. Um, yeah, because 27th is a half marathon. 26th. And I want every board member to get in shape. Superintendent Davis is supposedly changing. February. Did I say February? You said January. Scared me. Oh, my gosh. I've been, uh, you know what? Uh, the, I'm going to blame it on the cool weather in this Rosac building. <laughs> Too cold. Uh, so at any rate, <clears throat> the board members will be given a watch. And I will be expecting their time. Of course, I want to beat them all. And, uh, and that's easy. It's an easy challenge, by the way, because I'm not that fast. So uh, we're going to go ahead and give you a promo code. Thank you, Susan Harmling, the director of Gasparilla. So you get some money off. And uh, Dina Marshall uh, will put this code. Oh, I'll just send it to you all. Uh, then we have our April 2nd. Um, Fitness uh, 5K. Uh, Van, go ahead, say it loud. What's the name of the race? Race for Education. Right oh, April 2nd. And uh, I do believe, and I, I, I don't want to take a chance, but I do believe I have uh, Member Snively singing the national anthem. And uh, I do believe, I do believe, <laughs> let me change that to I do know that. Uh, Superintendent Davis has a training schedule, and we will try to beat perhaps Van Ayers on a 5K. The, the, it's out there. Uh, and all right, let me. I got 25 seconds. Thank you. Uh, the white coat ceremony at Dunbar, and I know Shake Washington knows about it, teaching fifth graders to prepare for their future in the medical industry. How critical is that? Wonderful experience. Thank you, Principal Cynthia Krim, and the wonderful teachers that make this happen. So much great things happening in our district. Ah, did it. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Member Gray. Member Perez? Thank you. So my announcement is dear and near to my heart. Um, in 1995, I decided I was living in Pinellas County for 15 years and decided to come back over to Hillsborough County become a single parent and come here. And I thought I was gonna be raising three children on my own, but Hillsborough County Schools taught me different. I had an amazing support system with Van Ayers, Anthony Peroni, April Gillard, to name a few, and they became co-parents with me with three amazing children. And today, my daughter, Carmen Perez, is her company, Techstars, I don't know if anybody knows that. They, yes, they actually um, picked up her company and she has now joined an alumni of 161 companies that have collectively gone on to raise over $2 million in capital. And she is one of Hillsborough County's students. So when, When we talk about our students, when we talk about our teachers, this is what Hillsborough County teachers do. They embrace us. They embrace parents like me. They become family. And, you know, Addison, we have to send a message to that we have a zero tolerance. I received a very troublesome um, video on Friday and in that video, one of our, our teachers, one of our staff, were trying to break up a fight. And, the, and this is not um, new to our, our school, not to our nation, not to our county. But, um, you know, when our teachers get hurt, when they're in school, um, we, you know, and videos are taken. When something happens in our school, 2% of the student body sees that. But when a video is sent out on social media, 
more than 2% of the students see it. And the impact that it has on our teachers is, is on their mental health, you know, is long lasting. Um, and we need to send a message um, that we have a zero tolerance. This, the security and safety of our staff comes first. Um, and compassion is the number one priority here in this administration. And, you know, to me, what I experienced as a parent, what enveloped my children here in Hillsborough County, is what I know Hillsborough County schools to be. And when I look at my daughter, when I look at my three children, how incredible they turned out to be because of Hillsborough County Schools and the support that I received, I know that 20 years later, we're still the same Hillsborough County Schools, but that we have to stand behind our teachers and our staff and our administrators. Because when I look out in this audience, one of the teachers that stood behind me and my children, Mr. Van Ayers, is now standing by your side. So I know we have an incredible Hillsborough County Schools, and I want to keep it that way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Washington? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, very well said, uh, Ms. Mr. Perez. You know, uh, being a former principal myself and area superintendent, I do believe in order in schools. And we do have to support our teachers 100 percent. And I, and I know sometimes, you know, you say, well, don't we can't do kids like this. But we got to understand you come to school to learn and do the things it take for a kid to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to piggyback off of that one. That, that was a great one. Uh, also, next week, when we go up to uh, Tallahassee, Monday, well, I got something to give to the governor for some students from uh, from Roland Park. And I want everybody to know what, what is in, in here. One of the uh, letters I read was teachers need pay raises. Oh. We need more money for teachers. So I got to make sure, Ms. Davis, that I deliver this or you deliver it to whoever need to be delivered to it. And thank you, Roland Park, for that. Uh, also, I'd like to thank... Uh, uh, I like to thank the um, the people who have always been involved to help students, and I'm going to talk about this. Pablo, do you have uh, the video? Okay, these are some young, some wonderful young students here, and they attend Stewart Miller Magnet School, and they're in the STEM. And Dr. Wilson is the is the principal there. Well, the Center for Advancement of Science in Space has awarded the Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Miller Magnet School STEM Booster Club a grant that totals $52,000. And it will bring together the faculty and the students from USF educators from Stuart Miller Magnet School, executives from MaxMar Technologies, and NASA professionals to increase the assessment resources associated with the International Space Station. US USF graduates and undergraduate students will also be involved in this project. It was wonderful. And I want, this is what we need, people need to understand. We have people from the outside that's coming in to help. And I want to thank USF and, and Max Technologies for uh, their input in, in awarding $52,000 for the boosters. Uh, also, also, Superintendent, I want to thank, thank you for the Lamb and Progress Village. It's been like that for years. I mean, Progress Village has been like that for, you can't get in and out. The traffic is horrible. People parking all in people's driveways. This is really going to be great. Uh, I really appreciate that. And also, I want to talk, thank Toba. We had a wonderful breakfast, MLK. It was really nice. Uh, Mr. Ransom did a great job. And we had an outstanding speaker. Phenomenal job. And also, we enjoy excellent in education. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, we had a lot of nominees, and but we had three people to win. But you know what? It comes up again next year. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And Madam Chair, you have it. Thank you very much, Member Washington. Member Vaughn? Thank you very much. Um, two, two things on the bucket before I kind of go into um, things I want to highlight. Um, have we started up the meetings about getting feedback on changing the mascots? So through the chair, 
Yes, Superintendent Davis, and I know um, Ms. Monica Veritorado, and I just spoke about that today. Yeah, yes, ma'am, to the chair. The, you know, our team has really taken some, some actions to be able to start to engage uh, our student body at Chamberlain and also at East Bay. Those, I believe, are going to start, I think, end of this week or beginning of the next week the, through uh, Dr. Vera Torado. The same thing with Mr. McCauley are going to go collectively to be able to initiate those conversations. Doc, you want to say anything? Can we get an updated timeline on that? Can we get an updated timeline sent to us? Email, thank you. Um, and then the next thing I just wanted to kind of talk about was I love that you addressed some of the things that you want to highlight and make changes in the district. So students who feel like they've been bullied or targeted with sexual harassment have an easier time reporting that maybe outside the school to make sure that they feel safe and supporting that. I know that many of us have met with some parents that have been at the board meetings and that was at the top of their suggestions, but not just making sure that we're implementing those, but that we're getting that message across in the schools. So I know that when we talked earlier, you said one of the things driving up maybe some of the mental health referrals is doing a really good campaign to allowing students to know how to access those services. So I would like to see something similar to that, whether it's posters in our schools, whether it's teachers going over in the curriculums again, that highlights if you feel that you have been you know, a, a per, you've been sexually harassed, if you've been bullied, and you do not feel comfortable reporting at your school site, here's where you can do it, here's how you can report it, and partnering, as you mentioned, with 211 and knowing that the crisis center is there with services so that our students feel that they have support and they know how to take advantage of those services. It's, it's one thing to put it on where they log in, and I know that you put a lot of effort into it, so I appreciate that, but I think it's really important to make sure that it's in our schools, it's on posters, it's talked about and the students know how to access that. So I appreciate that. Um, I also want to talk about the Excellence in Education Awards. It was phenomenal. I really appreciate everybody's hard work and all of our partners. The photographer who was sitting next to me was literally weeping through almost the entire thing when every escort got up to talk about the person who was nominated and how they had impacted their lives. You know, what I heard over and over again echoed is this teacher told me I could do it because they believed in me and what important words those are. And just being a part of that event was amazing. I really appreciate it. Um, talking about Black History Month, um, <laughs> Member Washington and I were also in the Tampa Parade, the MLK Parade, which is a very long route, but very, very, very uh, rewarding. And that was amazing. Um, and the Toba Breakfast. So I love talking about and highlighting. And I know we spend a lot of time Frustrated with the confines of the state, which I, you know, I do want to talk about and address, but Hillsborough County, you know, I don't want it to be lost on the great things that are happening in our schools. You know, how much everybody on here and everybody in our district cares about our students and the amazing things that are happening. I'm glad that we highlight that. Um, we have had a lot of conversation tonight about the confines between the state and what happens at the board. And I think it's important for the public to really understand that. We get a lot of emails about frustrations that, they, that, that our community thinks that we have control over, and unfortunately we don't. So what I'd like to advocate for is for all of our members who care about education, all of our community members who write us and advocate and come here and speak because they really care about traditional public education and what's happening in our schools to really relay this message to our, our, our leaders at the state level. Because, you know, if you look at what's coming out of Tallahassee, what it feels like is it's really a campaign to penalize school board members who are fighting back um, in trying to save or stand up for traditional public education. Instead of bills coming out to help our struggling st our staff members to address COVID, to really build the infrastructure of our traditional public education, what's coming out is, you know, arbitrary things to, to encourage people to come and harass school board members, to, to take away our pay so only people who can afford, who, who don't have to have jobs can afford to do this, to talk about partisanship when that should be a local decision. The ability to make decisions for our district is slowly being stripped away. And if that's the case, then we don't need a school board. They should just abolish it. Because right now what they're doing is setting us up to be a scapegoat for all of our community's concerns who think that we don't care about or we're not taking action to address the concerns. And so I really, really want to advocate for people who come and speak to also be invo involved at the state level and pay attention to what 
Tallahassee and our governor is prioritizing when it comes to education and be a voice. They need to hear from you. Maybe Member Snively is right. They're, they're not tapped in and they don't know what our community wants. So please make sure that you're writing your legislators and the same passion that you put into advocating at the school board level, you carry that on to the state. So I, I, I appreciate everybody. It's good to be back and um, I'm looking forward to all the good things we're going to do this year. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I, I always, um, when, it, you remind me, I almost called you Dr. Vaughn. I gave you a promotion too. <laughs> Member Vaughn, uh, when, when we have our, our forums with our school students, our uh, middle school and high school students, when we do our forum, you know, um, at one point we started asking the question back to the student, you know, with the, because they come to us with a lot of concerns, just like the speakers we hear come to our school board meetings with a lot of concerns. And um, so we challenge our school students to come up with solutions as well, right? And so, uh, but one of the things we talk about is when they do have a challenge, where do they go? They find, you know, because they might complain to their teacher or they might complain to their parent or they might complain to somebody that's not a decision maker, right? And so, you know, what, what you're saying is true. There's a lot of decisions, more so than I've ever seen as a school board member since 2014, being made by our state legislature and not being made by our, our school district anymore. And so it's really important when you're advocating to know where, who you should be talking to. Because a lot of the times, unfortunately, we don't have the authority they come to, to us about you know funding or what, whatever the situation is and that is you know uh to be redirected to the people that are making those decisions and so i think it's important to encourage advocacy i believe in it i believe in people participating in the process and democracy i think it's very important to do your homework and realize that there are certain uh certain people who make certain decisions and you go advocate for those whether it's here at the school district it's a decision we make or the state legislature or or congress know who your decision makers are so that you can advocate to the right people because we feel it you know we feel them we we're we're trying to be compassionate there are certain things that we just unfortunately can't control because we're not the decision makers. But, um, but I, we want to help and like what we're doing next week is going to Tallahassee and we are advocating. All of us are going up to uh, talk to our legislators and make sure that we um, express our concerns about what's happening in public education in our school district. That's not really what I was going to say, but thanks for inspiring me. So anyway. Um, I wanted to really quickly thank Yvonne Fry and Danny McIntyre. Uh, they came to talk about Future Career Academy, and unfortunately, it got moved on the agenda at the last minute. And so I wanted to apologize because they drove here from Plant City, um, and then they, they left. So, but um, I, I appreciate, we, we're going to fix that. We're going to work on, on, on that. Um, I spoke to Chair Va uh, um, Combs, sorry, <laughs> Chair Combs, and we'll, we'll work on that. But the main thing is Future Career Academy, Career Academy is a great program that's been in place and it's growing um, and it allows students the opportunity to go visit companies that are hiring. They go out to field trips. They have people come in to talk to them. And it started out in Plant City. We started in the auditorium one year. It was really sweet and cute. And then we, we expanded it. And now we're doing it at King, Middleton, Armwood, Durant, Simmons, Strawberry Crest, Plant City, New Sun Leonard and East Bay High Schools. And so I would encourage um, those schools to get as many students as they can to participate because it is just an eye opener for our students to see what's available to them outside of school once they graduate. And it's not just go to, you know, go to your local um, uh, gas station or coffee store or grocery store and apply because there are hundreds of jobs that are being created in Tampa Bay and we need to prepare our students um, for what's out there. So thank you Yvonne and Danny. Maybe we'll get them to come back and, and say a few words about Future Career Academy and tell us all of the wonderful things once the field trips are done. Um, and then for um, the Improvement League of Plant City, um, as uh, Member Perez mentioned, we went to the, the breakfast the other day. I wanted to thank them for hosting the MLK Leadership Breakfast and the John Dix Foundation Scholarships. We, uh, they were able to give out eight scholarships, one, I think they were $1,000 a piece, to eight students in the um, Eastern Hillsborough County schools, and that was really uh, a wonderful time. So thank you for doing that. And then, thank, and then congratulations to the um, 
EIE winners, uh, that's just, uh, especially with everything that's going on right now, um, it's amazing what our teachers are doing and what our faculty are doing. And um, uh, I hope that we can um, continue to show our appreciation in many ways, whichever ways we can, uh, for, what, for everything that they're doing to keep schools going. So thank you uh, and congratulations to our winners. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. And I'm really looking forward to the Future Career Academy. I'll also be participating this year, and I'm hoping we can expand that into the town and country area. Um, first, I just want to give my deepest condolences to the Wilson family whose father passed away on Friday. Um, uh, Miss McCoy from Lato High School decided to do a graduation for a really young, special uh, young man who had over a 7.0 GPA, and he's placed, you know, ninth in Lato High School because his father wasn't going to be unable to see him graduate. His father passed away today, but he was able to see his son graduate. And I have to say, the number of faculty and staff and teachers that were there was really overwhelming. And thank you to um, Gary Brady, our area superintendent, who, who came, who lives all the way in South Tampa and came. And that was such a, a special and wonderful um, moment. Um, I also want to recognize all the education and Excellence Awards. The best part were the speeches from the students, and I remember when the students were nervous, the teachers would come up and just make sure that they were doing okay. So you could see, I mean, all the nominees and everybody else, I wanted to congratulate them. And also, I wanted to uh, say thank you to Superintendent Davis and the Cabinet for really focusing on refurbishing our libraries, because we know what's really important at the center of everything is making sure that kids can read. If we want them to have an opportunity for workforce development, we have to push reading. And to think that we're saying human trafficking is related to books, well, this is what's related to books more than any, uh, this is what's related to human trafficking. If a child is reading a book, there's not gonna be someone who's gonna be grooming them. The grooming comes with the, these phones that are readily available all throughout school, the kids are texting each other, you know, using them for multiple reasons. So, you know, when we're really looking at issues, it, it's not just books, it's the phone. So I really wanna talk about that. And I think all this evening, we had many speakers come in and talk about uh, Florida pu public schools and the funding for Florida public schools. And so, Pablo, I, I wanted to share this um, screenshot with everybody. What does it look like for the funding for the base student allocation? In 2007, our allocation was $4,100. 13 years later, we're at $4,300. In 13 years, our base student allocation has only increased by $208. With the number, with the inflation, especially in the Tampa Bay area, you tell me 13 years later, how are we supposed to educate our children, mental health, dual enrollment classes, workforce development, all the things that we're doing. The Florida per pupil spending is 43rd in the nation. It's misleading when we see the teacher salary, beginning teacher salary is 30th. That's great, let's lure people in, but guess what? We are 49th in the na nation for the average teacher salary. That means after 10 years, 15 years, 20, 25, 30 years, you're making very little compared to when you first started. And then finally, when we look at capital improvement, and we look at the property tax here in Hillsborough County, the per pupil allocation, you'll see the state average is $1,214. What does that mean? We're property poor. So we only, our allocation per student is only $825. So we are expected to do what we are doing today with the needs greater than ever with an allocation of 20 years. So. Everyone needs to go to Tallahassee. We need to shout out. When I hear that we're spending record money on public education, that's because there's record number of students that are coming here. And it's not the charter schools that are taking away the money, it's the base student allocation. And how are, we, how are charter schools profiting from $4,000? So we need to continue to fight, and I'm gonna say this every day, and I cannot wait to go to the Capitol, because I am ready to speak to some legislators and ask for more funding for our students. Thank you, and have a great evening, and this meeting is adjourned.